Hi, I'm Chris James, and you're watching Healthy Alternative. Today, I want to talk about the benefits of Michael, and today we're going to be talking about... Today, we'll be making one of my favorite suits. Welcome to the JR72 Challenge. I am Animated Mel, and I am your mental and wellness coach for Animated Mel. As always, perfection is not needed, but consistency We must first lovingly accept what is. You can't heal a body you can't. gonna bring up your, your next speaker that's gonna be the wonderful magnificent Chris James if you talk about how much you hate your fat your body has been working all this time to keep you alive I don't think anybody in my circle understands impossible What you think, Justin? What you think? I always love your intro gets me all hyped up every time. You're probably like <laughs> watching me off stage, like hopping <laughs> around like an idiot. But yeah, that gets me amped up. <laughs> yeah, man, that's um, uh, it's definitely got that up tempo mm -hmm. kind of vibe to it. Welcome everybody to the um, live stream show tonight. This show is actually being uh, streamed on both my channel and Justin's channel. Yeah. So we're going to be co-hosts tonight. But really, Justin, I mean, this is really your show because um, you had mentioned that you had some questions and comments and things like that that yeah. you wanted to go over from our last interview. So that was really the main point of tonight for sure. Yeah, I know your your interview that I did on my channel where I interviewed you and you were talking about the water fasting it was your brother who lost what, like a hundred pounds in 90 days. And mm -hmm. there were a bunch of questions, a lot of views on that video. And, and there's a bunch of questions, some that I could answer and a lot that I couldn't. And so that's why I wanted to get together with you again. First and foremost, before I forget, my friend Jeff, his question was, what's up with the sombrero on Captain, on Captain America back there? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Mexico um, in 2019. It, was, it wasn't it was for my birthday. My birthday just happened to be at the time that we went, right? We did yeah. a cruise. And Captain America is actually my favorite. Uh, I'll say he's my favorite Marvel superhero. And so this, this dude had like these hand-carved superheroes and just characters, different things. And I was just like, man, that thing is so dope. <laughs> and I, but it's so big like i don't know if you could tell like it's pretty big oh yeah and no it looks small back there but i didn't realize it was that far back yeah it's it's pretty like it's pretty sizable so i brought it on this i was i was trying to figure out how i'm gonna get it on the ship because i just had like a carry-on bag and i didn't want it to get broken or anything like that but anyway um i got this hat from mexico yeah. and i got captain america from mexico and i just figured Hey, it works. That's that's what we doing, man. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So yeah, I've got a bunch of different questions um from different people from that original interview. So and, and anybody watching too, if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, as Chris said, we're streaming this to my channel and his channel. So if there's a little bit of weird weirdness that goes on, bear with us there. This is the first time we've stream to two different channels that way um but i guess first the first question i have um is from queenie b she asked how do you deal with dizziness from fasting every time she gets to the third day she starts getting dizzy lightheaded and blacking out and she's taking electrolytes i think you just did a video on this too didn't you i probably did i i actually um so I actually got a whole bunch of questions from my audience and I put together a video where I broke down all the questions. Mm. So that's probably what you're talking about. But yeah, the dizziness thing is super common. You know, first, I like people to kind of understand where the dizziness potentially is coming from, because it could be a multitude of different things. But typically when we're talking about fasting it's from low blood pressure. So, yeah. you know, depending on how many days you're in 
what your blood pressure is normally. I see somebody just mentioned in the comment section they yeah. can't stop taking their blood blood pressure medication while or can they stop taking their blood pressure medication while fasting? Um, when you have high blood pressure, fasting is typically going to naturally lower your blood pressure. So depending on if you're starting off with high blood pressure or normal blood pressure, this is going to affect you differently. But um, there's a couple ways to kind of like avoid it, but there's no perfect solution. OK, right. so. Well, if you're doing juice fasting, then you probably won't get it, you know, um, because you're getting the sustenance from the juice. Um, with water fasting, I find that preparation is the best thing you could do to like help mitigate like low blood pressure or other type of symptoms like that. Um, you know, some people recommend taking a little bit of uh, salt in their water. It's not anything that I've ever tried personally for the dizziness, but I have heard people say that it helps. Yeah. There is an essential oil called marjoram that is good for blood pressure. And that's probably the way that I would go like to keep it just, you know, I love essential oils. I think they're beneficial. So either prep really well. We have a prep guide, uh, AHA, we've got a prep guide and we've got supplements we recommend that'll help. And, but if you're in the mix and you're fasting, get yourself some marjoram essential oil and make sure that it's a food grade or therapeutic, therapeutic grade. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Something too that I just remembered now as you were talking, when I lost all my weight by doing, you know, kind of just rolling longer fasts, I used to get really lightheaded. I remember several times and it's weird. You mentioned blood pressure and that's why it kind of triggered the memory is I would, it would typically happen when I would bend down, right. To pick something up. Mm -hmm. And then when I would, I would come back up, I'd see these like, like shooting stars in my eyes and I mean, this was probably like nine, 10 years ago. I haven't experienced it since. I don't know if that's possibly because my body's gotten used to fasting, but also like when I was doing those longer fasts, even to this day, my blood, my, my not just my blood pressure, I've actually never checked my blood pressure. My heart rate drops really low when I'm fasting. Like yeah. I'll lie down in bed, like 48 to 72 hours into a fast and my heart rate's like 42 beats mm. per minute like it's low but i'm fine yeah. i'm not dead <laughs> well it's still beating right <laughs> it's still beating it's just really really low yeah yeah so um that actually brings up another point um i do i do usually recommend that people stay away from like saunas and like really hot showers especially mm. if you already know you're susceptible to you know the dizziness and, and the kind of fainty feeling it's um you know i, I would probably I'm not going to tell you to take cold showers. I mean, cold showers probably would be good for you, but you want to stay stay away from them hot showers and saunas. Yeah. Um, but like, blood shower blood, would be brutal, man. Like I'm cold, cold when I fast. Like I get really cold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we talked about this, but I get this question all the time. You know, why do I get cold when I fast? It's because your blood is literally going inward. Yeah. You know, it's re it's retreating inward to help you do healing and work. And that's why. So. Um, I'm actually gonna, I'm looking up the oil to make sure marjoram is the correct one. And then I'll it, just spit it's it funny out. You once mentioned I'm... essential, essential oils. I literally have one bottle of essential oil and I keep it on my desk when, when I'm like first thing in the morning trying to work, it's frankincense. Oh, I like, yeah. <laughs> For some reason it like wakes me up and makes me feel more clear headed. It could be placebo, but I don't know. I keep doing it. <laughs> no, frankincense is one of the most powerful uh essential oils yeah in the bible they took frankincense and myrrh, and myrrh to yeah. um to jesus when he was born uh those are really really powerful essential oils yeah yeah let's see yeah so going back to that question can can you stop taking your blood pressure medications while fasting um i mean i would be you know remiss if i didn't say that we're not doctors so I can't advise you to stop taking any medication, but if, if you're checking your blood pressure and stuff while you're fasting and you think that you might be able to scale back from it, just have a discussion with your doctor and let him know what you're doing. And if he's a, if he's a decent enough doctor, he should, you know, give you the go ahead to test some things out. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's their job, right? It's to manage the, the, it's to manage the entire situation. So a manager is going to, regularly check in with the employees.
Hey, how are you guys doing? Hey, how are you feeling? Oh, there's an issue here. Let's see if we could solve that. Like a manager is not a, you know, it's not just someone just dictating orders, like without interacting. So right. your doctor, if you have a good doctor, they should be kind of having a back and forth. It shouldn't just be them telling you what to do. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I will I will say this, Justin, because like I used to get these questions a lot about medication and you you always want to be careful about how you answer it. But um, one thing I did learn is I can talk about other people's experiences. Yeah. And in my community, we had a lot of people on blood pressure medication. That was just like a normal thing. Mm -hmm. And so they would post about how not only not only did they stop using their blood pressure medication while fasting, they they had to. Because what, what would happen is the body is going oh. to naturally adju adjust your blood pressure. Right. But then you're taking that artificial drug to adjust it. Dropping and it even this, lower. And so now you get into a, like a critical uh, stage where you have to adjust it. So that's yeah. also another way to look at it. Well, yeah, there was uh, an individual who commented on, I can't remember if it was your interview or Jerome's interview or one of my fasting videos, who's actually a type one diabetic. Um, you know, which differs from type two diabetes and that your body literally doesn't produce insulin. And so I was asking him, you know, what kind of adjustments does he make when he fasts? And he does scale back from his insulin when he's fasting because it, everything does change when you're fasting. That's true for type two diabetes too, mm -hmm. which is probably why it's a good idea if you have, if you're on insulin, you work with your doctor because you're going to have to stop taking as much. Otherwise you risk, you know, a diabetic coma and that makes sense to me what you're talking about the blood pressure if you're still taking the medication but the fasting's lowering your blood pressure it's just gonna dip it that much lower that much more quickly too yeah yeah man it's um you know this is why it's a personal journey this is why i tell people don't just listen to someone else pay attention to your body how do you feel on your fast like we all have different chemistry going on and you got to be able to adjust so I like to educate people and get them to understand more of the full picture so that they can make adjustments on the fly. Yeah. I like that. Oh yeah. And then he said to did a 21 day fast, took no medication, high blood pressure, diabetic medication, nothing. And he did fine. So that's awesome. You know, kind of answered your own question there. Um, but just keep an eye on it. And like Chris just said, you know, test these things out, you know, record the data for yourself and make adjustments as you go forward. Cause it is going to be different for each individual person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's incredible. What, you know what, I'm going to say this too, since we're on the topic, um, most people who take medication regularly, first of all, you always got to remember there was a time when you had the this this ease or whatever that you're taking the medication for and you were not on the medication yeah. you because yeah. you know no one no one starts getting a disease and then the medication just automatically pops up like we gotta usually it usually gets pretty bad before you're like oh let me go and get checked mm -hmm. so you you it's you know you can live without it depending right like obviously it's a little gets a little dicey with certain things but you guys know your your own circumstance and also remember like, I'm sure there's days where you forget to take it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, some people are on t 10, 12 medications. If you forget to take your medication, like, what what was that experience like? So you have, you have a little bit of room to test and talk to your doctor and just kind of, like, you know, have that experimentation. Yeah. Um, you know. All right. Easy question for you here. <clears throat> Can this is from Diva Kim? Uh, can you put lemon in your water when doing a water fast? So think back. This is your brother who was doing. You know, he lost a hundred pounds in ninety days. So that's what they're referring to. Her follow up question was: Were you talking about dry fasts with absolutely nothing, or water fast? We know you were talking about water fasting because I don't think anybody could dry fast for. 90 days straight but <laughs> if you're drinking just water during the fasting is it okay to put lemon in it yeah lemon um not only is it okay i would actually i would actually say it's a benefit now obviously you know when you very first start doing it, it's probably no problem if you're just drinking purely lemon water like throughout your whole fast 
for multiple days, you know, the acidity from the lemon juice might start to irritate your throat a little bit. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't do it like every day exclusively. But what I would suggest is at least once a day, first thing in the morning is probably like the most optimal time to do it. I just recommend getting a couple lemon slices, putting in your water, put it by your nightstand before you go to sleep and then drink it first thing when you wake up. And that'll help wake up your elimination system that I'm sure is working on overtime because you're fasting. Yeah. So uh, that would be super beneficial. And then, like you mentioned, yeah, we're talking water fasting. And also, just to create clarity for my brother, he didn't do like 90 days straight. Right. Yeah. So, um, but I want to say that water, I think during that fast, water fasting was the only thing we did. Yeah. So it's just water. I do get those questions a lot. I get a lot of comments too on videos where I document like the fast that I do. So like if I'll, if I drink coffee with, you know, and I'll put heavy cream in my coffee, I'll get comments that that's not fasting because heavy cream definitely breaks a fast. And I just let the comments be because the really, <laughs> the question you really need to answer is like, what are you fasting for? Like if you're mm -hmm. fasting to be in ketosis and lose weight, a little bit of heavy cream in your coffee or some MCT oil, right? Like is not going to break ketosis for you. If you're fasting more for autophagy, then maybe you do want to steer away from even a little bit of lemon juice could in theory, you know, break a perfect water fast. Um, but if you're just looking for the benefits of weight loss and improved health, like I would not, and Chris, you can, you know, choose to agree or disagree with me. Um, I wouldn't stress over the minor details, like squeezing a little bit of lemon juice in your water yeah i mean um yeah so you know i think you kind of nailed it the what are you fasting for what's your goal what what is what type of fast are you performing so for example you have a water fast right which is fasting with water then you have liquid fasting which is not fasting with just water it's liquids right, right? so then you could do cream you could do you know milk or whatever you could do Bone juice broth. you could do broth like um and and the, the really i think the difference is it's like it's like what what are what are the outcomes you're looking for yeah. um obviously if your goal is to get as much weight loss during this process as possible yeah i'm going to recommend you just keep it as keep it as pure as possible um when it comes to the actual technicality of it a lot of people look at fasting as getting your body into ketosis yeah. that's kind of really how they look at it you even have the fasting mimicking diet where you're actually eating but you're like fasting mimicking yeah. because your body's in ketosis so it really just depends but i used to be i used to teach more of a purist uh style because i wanted to make sure people were getting results right if i tell you you could drink coffee that's like a slip slippery slope yeah you know <laughs> it's coffee then it's like a little tea and then it's yeah. like well what about Coke Diet up. Coke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? So um that that was my whole thing with that. But yeah, I mean, and then also just like pay attention to your body. Look, Justin, if you said, Chris, like I could do a two-week fast, but I gotta have a little coffee in the morning. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna say do the two-week fast it. with the coffee. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Versus not doing it or only being able to do like three days or something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 That was another comment that somebody asked that they have, they have trouble sticking with longer fasts unless then they put like a tablespoon of MCT oil in their coffee and then it makes their fasting really easy. Then I'm like, just do it then, you know, like it's better to do the longer fast than like you said, to not do anything at all because it's too difficult to do. Like you can work your way to getting more, you know, strict and stringent with it. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Jason Fung talks about this, too. Mm -hmm. He's a huge advocate of having some bone broth or veggie broth yeah. or whatever with your fasting. Um, the only the only caveat that I have with this whole thing is depending on what you're taking, it can affect um, your ability. I, I guess it's I guess it's autophagy because. Some people will fast with certain products, certain things, certain supplements, and it will help promote loose skin. Whereas mm -hmm. 
you know, with the pure water fasting, <clears throat> we see very little loose skin. Yeah. So there's a trade off sometimes depending on, you know, what you're taking. I think someone had mentioned electrolytes they were taking earlier. Yeah. And depending on what electrolyte, because when people say electrolytes, it's like, what does that mean? Like, right. there's a, it's not like just one thing. Um, uh, yeah. So I would just say be careful. But infused water has always been a safe thing for my community to drink. We don't have to worry about the loose skin. You can get electrolytes from the infused water. So, you know, that's one way to do it. Yeah. Um. I know you start a couple of these. I want to show this one because this one intrigues me. Thoughts on a 45 to 55 day spring water fast. So I I know like you and I both know Shane Eidelman. Um, I know you know several other people who have done 40 day fasts and just doing water. Um, I don't know anyone who's gone beyond 40. I think it's probably just because it's biblical. You know, Jesus did a 40 day fast that so they all just stop at 40. But <laughs> yeah. what, what's your experience going beyond 40 days? Like does and actually, sorry, I know this is a long winded question here, but this just popped into my head. Does starvation start to kick in beyond 40 days? I feel like I've heard that somewhere. Is that true or is that a myth? Yeah, so uh, I've actually um, experienced. I've actually experienced or interacted with several people that have done more than than forty five days. The thing about it is, I think it really depends on how much um, body mass you have. Like, mm -hmm. if you've got a tremendous amount of excess weight, forty five days can be a drop in the bucket. I mean, we've had so many people in our community that are in the 450 to 550 range. Yeah. And they're always knocking out, you know, 40 days, 60 days, 180 days. Like they knock those things out like it's nothing. And we got to remember that, you know, all of us can't necessarily do that. But depending on where you're at, like you could do it. Yeah. Um, when it comes to starvation, there's a couple keys that I have found. Number one, there's a huge mental component. Like when you're starving, it, it, the mental component is I don't know where my next morsel of food's going to come from. Right. And that that plays a bigger role than anybody really, like, I think, takes into account. And if we look at the nocebo effect and the placebo effect, we understand the power of the mind. So when you're in a very poor mental state, that can plays into starvation. And I actually recommend that people do not fast if they're in a very poor mental state. Yeah. The other piece is, once again, how much weight do you have? How much fat, how much excess body weight do you have? If you have excess fat, you could keep fasting. So like, like, for example, if you're 500 pounds, you could fast for a year straight. Yeah. But if you're, if you're 180 pounds and you might have maybe an extra 20 pounds of, you know, excess weight, fasting for a year straight might not be the healthiest thing for you. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and you reminded me too, like as soon as I ans asked that question to you, and I just looked it up too, <clears throat> because Jason Fung talks about this guy in his book too, and I know other guys have talked about him too. His name was Angus Barbieri, I think. Mm -hmm. He's the one who has the longest recorded fast. It was 382 days. Yeah. So he was, you know, he had a lot of extra body fat. He lost 276 pounds fasting for over a year. The one caveat was that he did it under um, like medical supervision. I, I think they were infusing him with vitamins and minerals or he something. He did take vitamins, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, didn't starve, lost 276 pounds of body fat. And I think he maintained that weight until the day he died. His yeah, new I think weight. he did. I don't, think, I don't remember hearing he gained it all back. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see a YouTube video on that one yet. Nah. <laughs> you know, the, the interesting thing about his story is if you look, have you seen the pictures of him when he finished? I just pulled it up. Yeah. I can pull okay. it back up again. Um, so when you look at the pictures of him when he finished, you know, he's a slim guy. Yeah. But the, he lost, um, 180, 85 pounds or whatever it was. But he went 388 days or what, whatever, whatever it was. So he yeah. fasted longer than he actually technically needed to. Right. Because um, 
And I, man, I would love to, man, it would have so, it'd been so great to talk to him. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure his, his weight loss slowed dramatically yeah. as he got to the end of his fast. You yeah. know, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, I'm still 50 pounds overweight. So let me do another 30 days. Like he, he was probably in a mental state where he was feeling like, I don't really need to eat anymore. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with breatharians or if you've like gone down that rabbit hole. Mm -mm. Really? Um, no. Nope. Here we go. One of Chris's <laughs> rabbit holes. Let's hear it. <laughs> I mean, breath breatharians. It's super simple. Okay. So the belief is that that human beings are are able to subsist off of prana or uh, um, I have I've know a couple of those people. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Co cosmic energy. It depends on the belief system. What they call it. And so it's it's all you get it through the sun and the air. There's moisture in the air as well. Like there's always moisture in the air. So through breathing techniques, you can actually absorb moisture into the skin. You'll usually typically see that if they're genuine um, uh, breatharians, they're not going to wear clothes like we wear. You know, typically they're either as naked as possible or they wear like breathable linens and stuff like that because um, they're eating from the air is like cosmic energy I like air ferns <laughs> you remember yeah. those air ferns hey look very good <laughs> yes very good in that yeah i like that i never thought about that um i actually have a term i call us plantables we're plants and animals plantables hmm. and um that that the air fern that reminds me of that so okay. yeah so i i've i've it's hard to verify um, I will say that I do believe that there are people I can verify that have gone at least 30 days without eating or drinking and kind of subsisting off air. And, and they were very slim to begin with. It wasn't as if they were, you know, like losing a whole bunch of weight. Right. And there was one guy in India who actually was monitored over the course of I think it was two weeks. Um, he was in a hospital and he was monitored by like a team of doctors is like 10 or 12 doctors. And they would take his vitals and they watched him. He didn't pee or have a bowel movement the entire time. He ate nothing and his he vitals were nothing. perfect. He drank he nothing. Drank, he drank nothing. That's yeah. bizarre. See, this blows my mind. This goes against like everything that I've learned, you know? I'm going to have but to look into it. But you just said air ferns, though. Well, yeah, but I'm not an air fern. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's no. possible, though. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm going to look into it. Yeah. That's why I love talking to you. You know so much more than I do. All these different things that I've never heard of. I'd only heard of like one person who had who has done that. I've seen some bizarre things lately too. You know, like some people that teach others to stare into the sun. You know, mm -hmm. have you seen that? Sun, yeah, sun gazing. Yeah, sun gazing. Popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm going through the questions here that we're getting because we're getting some good ones. And um, if you've put a question in here, don't fret. I have marked it. We will get to it. Do you think it's safe for bariatric patients? I've lost 80 pounds. I want to lose another 30 pounds, but mainly for toning. So is fasting, water fasting safe for somebody who's had bariatric surgery? Do you want me to uh, kick that off? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, fasting, fasting is, is I, there's not, when it comes to those types of surgeries, the weight loss surgeries, and there's not one in particular that I could think of that where fasting would be dangerous. Obviously, I'm assuming from this comment, it's been a while, right? Like you, yeah. you had the surgery, it's been a while, you lost 80 pounds. And so now you're just looking to, to tone up. Yeah, you could do it. That's, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, I would think that that's why I had you take it. I figured that was the answer on that one. Um, dry fast 21 days. And I think that was just a misread. Um, the How Blind is Justice did a 21 day fast with no medication. It wasn't a dry fast. It was a water fast, not a oh, 21 gosh. day dry fast. He wasn't an air fern for 21 <laughs> days. <laughs> I, do, I did have a I did have a guy come on the show. He's actually a um, a colleague. He um, he did he would do twelve day dry fast if I remember correctly. Wow, that's crazy. Days. Yeah, yeah. uh huh. I'll have to look into that too. Uh, that's on your channel, Justin Howell. All right, gotcha. Yeah. 
All right, I have lots of loose skin on my abdomen. Will I need to do longer fasts than 21 days, which would be a huge challenge for me? Um, before I pu uh, punt this back to you, Chris, just my experience from this. So, um, you know, when I came on your channel, you interviewed me. I lost 43 pounds in like two and a half months. Um, I should have loose skin, but I don't. And I never did longer than the longest I made it was about nine days. Uh, most of my fasts were between three and five days long. And I did it really rapidly and I didn't have any loose skin. There was like a year after I lost all the weight that I could like grab, like pinch, do a little pinch below my belly button. But that eventually went away. And I don't think I did anything longer than a 48 hour fast in that year following. So my personal experience would be, no, you don't have to do a 21 day fast. Uh, I think as long as you get yourself into autophagy and do it regularly, um, you should be able to, you know, tighten that up. But Chris, what do you think? Yeah. Um, you know, you don't, um, well, you know, it depends on what your goals are. If you want to, if you want to really get rid of the loose skin quickly, like you know, I know for some people, it's one of those things that it just it bothers them. It's 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 almost as similar to being overweight or right. It's a self-conscious thing. I'm going to recommend the longer fast because um, what I've documented is this thing. I call it the shrink week. So if you guys hear shrink fasting shrink week, you know where it came from. But yeah, it's basically if you fast for 14 days on day 15 of your fast, your body will begin to slow down the weight loss and it'll begin to ramp up autophagy and the shrinking and tightening go through the roof. And we, I think we talked about this, Justin, on your channel because my brother had a, uh, a day where he lost like four inches. It was absolutely absurd. Yeah. So day, day, you know, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 ish, mm -hmm. you're going to basically shrink mm -hmm. and tighten. And so the 21 day fast is really good for that. Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to. Right. But, you know, it's if I would work up to it, like if you have a lot of loose skin, like if you've got, let's say that you did maybe a traditional method to lose weight and you've got 20 pounds of loose skin, which yeah. is that happens. Yeah, I, I would probably push you to do 21 day fast because you know, it's it's kind of hard to see the benefit if you're not kind of pushing yourself. So, I mean, that's what it is. Yeah, no, I like that. And and something that just popped into my head as as you were saying that is, if 21 days seems like as as Matilda's saying here a huge challenge, like Chris said, start working your way up to it, and the results that you're going to see as you start to work your way up to it. It's just going to motivate you further. So maybe you make it seven days and you notice, oh, look, like now this is, you know, starting to shrink. I'm going to go for nine days the next time. I'm going to go for 14 days the next time. You eventually work your way up to a 21 day fast. By the time you've built up to doing that, it could all be gone. You never know. That's a very good point. Motivation. You know what? I got a, I got a colleague, man. Um, he specializes in water. Like I, I, he's like a water specialist. And one of the things he says is better is better. Yeah. And like, I, it's such a simple thing, but it's so powerful. So like if you fast for seven days and you see that you lose half an inch mm -hmm. and you've got like 15 inches that you want to lose. Yeah. Yeah. But better is better. Right. You only yeah. got 14 and a half inches now. Yeah. And just keep using that as motivation and yeah, if you could ramp it up, um, I haven't recorded because people don't do fasting too much more than like 21 to 30 days. I haven't really been able to see like a significant difference between 21 days and 40 days right. as it relates to the shrinking. Um, but there are some other things I've noticed with the 40 days fast that you don't get with like the 21 day fast that are, are unique. Um, but yeah, work up to it. I like that. Better is better. Yeah. Just test this, like we're always talking, like that's why you and I connected so well. We're always talking, like test these things out on yourself, try them out, see what works for you, get rid of what doesn't work for you, and just keep testing things out. All right, I think 
Oh, this one's interesting. I don't know the answer to this one. Do you know anyone who has had success water fasting, but they were diagnosed with lipedema? So they have lipedema already. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm assuming this question means. They have lipedema um, and they want to know if water fasting can help. Yeah, I mean, um, let's kind of let's kind of unpack what lipedema really is. What is yeah. what's, okay? So you retain your it's water retention, right? Mm -hmm. um, but or is that lymphedema? <laughs> so there's lymphedema and there's lipedema. Let me see. Oh, lipedema. Am I? Lipedema. Am I... Oh, okay. here we go. Tricia, lipedema is when the body stores fat in such a way that the brain doesn't recognize where the fat is stored. Interesting. That okay, one I'm okay. not actually familiar with. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that one. <clears throat> I thought you were talking about lymphedema. Yeah, lymphedema. lymphedema. Okay. You know, care. Lymphedema. It's it's very similar um, in in the in that the external symptoms present very similar. It says lipedema is a condition that mainly affects women's, characterized by a painful swelling in the legs, thighs, and buttocks, and sometimes yeah. the arms. It occurs because of the abnormal accumulation of fat in other tissues under the skin. Oh, so is it two different things? Sounds like, it, sounds like the same. Thing. People are testing us tonight. Yeah, lymphedema is a swelling due to the buildup of lymph fluid in the body. That's the one that I'm familiar with. Lipedema. Oh, oh. Lipedema is just the storage of body fat under the skin lymphedema is swelling due to lymph fluid but they both kind of would present with the same okay external. got you yeah okay yeah they're very very similar mm -hmm. um and so the so the answer is really the same if i was going to uh fast dealing with either or yeah i would recommend dry fasting mm. dry fasting would be the one that i would use you can use water fasting. You can use water fasting, but dry fasting is going to have a, a tremendous effect because what's happening is you're you're retaining fluid. We just kind of agreed to that. We're, we're retaining fluid. Um, and anytime that you have inflammation, the body is actually screaming for cellular hydration. It's saying that it's it needs hydration. When we look at it. I understand the optics and I understand why people wouldn't necessarily put the pieces to the puzzle together. But we got to understand the way the body speaks to us. So the body is screaming that it wants hydration. Um, but you get you can get the the swelling, essentially the swelling and all the extra fat. You can reduce that down with dry fasting very, very quickly. And then what I would do is I would focus heavy on high hyd cellular hydration, which you're going to get through your fruits, your vegetables. It's big, like you can eat raw. Um, that's going to be the best way to do it, like to eat raw foods. You don't have to eat necessarily exclusively raw, but if, if you this is an issue you've been dealing with for a while and you're really looking to resolve it, you're going to want to do raw. So like I would do whatever, whatever. I would take a month and do dry fasting, not necessarily 30 days straight, right? Maybe you could do three days at a time or five days at a time, whatever is reasonable for you. And then on month two, I would do raw food, you know, so I would take that 60 days to kind of focus on it. And then I would kind of take a look at where we're at after that. Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, that could literally be applied. That advice there too could be applied to pretty much any autoimmune condition or any type of disease that you're not sure how to treat it non-medically. That right there is probably a good starting off protocol to see what happens. 100%. Yeah. Quick shout out to How Blind Is Justice. She said, hey guys, I'm a female. I apologize. I call everybody guy. <laughs> I, I knew I knew she was a female. Oh, too man. Because. Why did you tell me? I, I hope I was just saying guy. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Mickey, Mickey said, okay, that's interesting. Um, the longest documented fast without food or water is Andreas Mihaivich from Austria. 18 days on a dry fast. Okay. That's good to know. That changes what I knew. No, no, no. You you were talking about the water fast, right? This is this is that's a dry fast. Yeah, this is a dry fast. The longest dry fast is eighteen days. Yeah, the previous one that we were talking about was a water fast, the three hundred and eighty-two yeah. days. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, oh, on that note, though, on that note with the dry fasting, I didn't talk about dry fasting for years because when I researched it, I found out that a lot of people had difficulty proving that they were um, dry fasting. So it, it this this um what I was really looking at was um breatharians. So we talked mm. about that earlier because dry fasting and breatharianism, like it's very close. Yeah. And um, the breatharians were trying to prove that they didn't really need to eat or drink. But they would put them in these these circumstances, a hotel room or, you know, like some cabin or whatever. Yeah. And uh, they would they would have issues. They would get blood drawn from them regularly and they would have a lot of issues. And then there was also like stories where some people like died and stuff. So I stayed away from the dry fasting for a while. So 18 days is a long dry fast. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, just be careful, y'all, when you dry fast. Like it's not a joke. You got to really know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, so Victor says by day five of a fast, I feel like I'm going crazy. Is that a sign of a particular salt or nutrient deficiency? I guess I need clarification on what what feel like you're going crazy. Me, <laughs> I feel like I go crazy every day, and I don't think it's because of salt. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, you want to you want to give your insight on that? Yeah, I mean, I know just my own personal experience um i've experienced all sorts of strange things that happen during longer fasts usually um they're more mental than they are physical i think the most physical thing that i ever dealt with was what i talked about earlier with the low blood pressure where i would you know see these like swimming stars in my eyes at times um just because my blood pressure had dropped so low um <clears throat> In terms of like, again, like clarification on what do you mean by you're going crazy? Like, do you feel like really anxious? Do you feel really energized? I mean, it could be if you feel really anxious and like, you know, I'm, I'm going crazy. It could be increased adrenaline, right? Or epinephrine from the, the longer fasting. But without further clarification, I don't know um, what that could possibly be. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say kind of like the second up what you what you're saying. Uh, we are definitely taught that fasting, going three days without food and water is like really really dangerous. That is what is taught. So it makes sense that your first thought is okay. I'm I'm on day five now. Like I'm I'm past the the point of no return. And the reality is the body is really capable of uh, subsisting much, much longer than what we have been told. So if you feel as though you're going crazy or whatever, I know there's a lot of information out there. I would say that I'm not going to completely discount a deficiency. But here's the thing that I want to say. Fasting didn't cause it. Your body, you weren't, you weren't, you weren't like normal you, you, you weren't in the normal range. Let's say it is a deficiency. You weren't in the normal range, and then you start fasting, and in five days, you have a deficiency. Right. That's not how that works. So hopefully that creates a little clarity without even knowing exactly what you're talking about. Um, what fasting will do is uncover deficiencies. If you have deficiencies, it will highlight them. So it could technically be a deficiency, depending on what we're talking about here, but it wouldn't be caused by fasting. Fasting might just bring it to the surface. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, let's see here. These are some, these are some good questions, man. How long and what type of fast do I need to do to reverse heart palpitations? <laughs> you got that one? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I experienced heart palpitations. So... Yeah. Uh, one of one of the issues that I had before I ever started fasting was heart palpitations. And what I noticed was when I started fasting, it actually made it worse, like at least three times worse. Mm. OK, so it was it was pretty scary. Um, if you do not normally deal with heart palpitations, fasting can cause them. Right. You'll, you'll fast and you're like, oh, I'm getting I never had these before. So I do want to make that known. It is not that you're damaging your heart or <clears throat> nothing. It's not a bad thing per se. It feels bad, yeah. but it's not a bad thing. So beautiful question here because the question is like, hey, how, do, how long do I got to fast to reverse it? Meaning you understand fasting is going to help rectify this problem. For me, 
this is a difficult question to answer accurately because it's been so many years. But I want to say that I did, I think I did like a 12 or 13 day fast. I believe I did like a 10 day fast and then like either an eight or a five day fast. And then I might have did like another five or, you know, less than 10 day fast. And by the time I completed that series of fasting, my heart palpitations were pretty much gone. Nice. So now that's just me. That was just, just my, yep. you know what I'm saying? Everybody doesn't even get them when they fast. So it's going to be different. But I would say, I would just say that if you fast consistently for two months, not like fast for 60 days straight, but like if you have a regimen where you're fasting, you know, more days out of that 60 days than you're not fasting, um, that probably will do it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I think what you just said is key. Like we've said this multiple times already, but you know, this is going to be individualized. So if you were to follow Chris's, you know, routine to the T, you're not guaranteed to reverse the palpitations at the same amount of time that he did could happen sooner. It could take longer. Um, but there is hope at least knowing that Chris used to experience these things and he doesn't anymore. And it's most likely because of the fasting. I haven't had a heart palpitate. I haven't. It's um. That's been uh six six seven years ago. Yeah, nice. I used to get them like weekly, like, and then it got it was getting worse and worse. Where I was, it was coming like once a day, twice a day. Yeah, you know, and now that it's been gone, I don't even think about it anymore. This is a, a <clears throat> side question curiosity for myself do you think part of that because i've never had heart pal palpitations do you think part of that could have been almost psychological or psychosomatic where you start to fear having another one and then you bring it on or do you think it's purely physical it, it's hard to discount um it's hard to discount the mental aspect of things yeah uh it's, my experience was different because I didn't, I wasn't afraid of them. Like, I didn't like think about it that much. I just knew my fear was greater than the heart palpitation itself. My fear was that something was going to like, I was going to have a heart attack or a heart condition. Right. So um, I think there you can definitely give yourself problems by focusing too much energy on it. I mean, that's what the nocebo effect is. It, yeah. It's a thing. but. No, I think if you're if you're not really focused on it, you're not really thinking about it. There's no major subconscious program running that's manifesting it. Then it's probably just a physical thing. Yeah, it's pretty common. Yeah. All right. I think I know your answer to this one, at least some of them. Patrick asked, what are some good herbs to take while fasting for general health and wellness? <laughs> You, you think you think you know my answer well no because all right so um i if you if if everybody here caught the interview that i did on chris's channel he told me about one of these products the roots the zero in product and i've been taking that for two months now and i know what's in that um i think the primary ingredient correct me if i'm wrong is really just turmeric um, mm -hmm. like yeah. really high grade turmeric. And I know there's a lot of good research out there on turmeric, anti-inflammatory, um, really good for general health and wellness. So that would be at the top of my list. Um, probably also cinnamon, um, cinnamon, somebody mentioned in the comments too berberine. I know there's a lot of good research on berberine, especially if you're dealing with insulin resistance, it can help to improve insulin sensitivity. Um, but yeah, as, as far as like to take in while you're fasting, <clears throat> again, this is just my experience, my personal experiences. I don't really take anything when I'm fasting. Um, there's been times in the past where, you know, I'd be taking multivitamins and some other supplements like fish oil and, you know, vitamin D with K2 in it. Um, I've done that while fasting is totally fine, but I've also done fasting, not taking any herbs or supplements and they've gone, I mean, they weren't any different noticeably to me. So, right. Yeah. Experimentation is, is really going to be king here. Like, you know, we've kind of been, this is the theme, like you got to really get to know your body a little bit better. 
<clears throat> it's good to get ideas from people, but what what are you taking when you fast that makes you feel the best? Yeah. You know, so I, I do my best to keep an open mind. I obviously we so at AHA, we have herbs. We have detox herbs and we have um like a parasite herb yeah. that uh it's 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 great for boosting detoxification. That's not really the question though. Yeah. When when I um when I was taking when I was fasting and I did take herbs like on my first fast or ar around my first fast when I said I had reversed the heart palpitations, I was taking the Dr. Sebi small cleanse package. I don't remember what herbs were in there, but those once again, those are detox herbs. So I've never actually taken like um herbs that are per se like for just like general health, but in our appetite suppressant tea, we have some herbs that are designed to nourish the cells. So um, I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put the ingredients for our appetite suppressant tea in the chat for you guys. Yeah, because uh, that it was formulated with the mindset that we wanted to nourish the cells. So this will kind of be closer to your question. It does suppress appetite too, so that's amazing. Yeah, but um, these are the herbs that are in there, and I don't even like saying these words because I don't know them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the second one's tricky, man. I'm gonna let you handle it. I know fenugreek, I know chickweed, yerba mate. Yerba mate is good too, by the way. That stuff I used to drink that all the time instead of coffee. Lemongrass and hibiscus. The second one, I don't know that one, and uh, I will butcher it. I don't I don't know any of them, yeah. man. I um, we actually we work with a herbalist and I let him handle all the heavy lifting on that. Yeah. He'd be like, Yeah, we're gonna put some, you know, hibiscus and some yerba mache and so just like and I'm like, uh-huh, yeah. Cool. Uh oh, I think it's it important to stay in your lane, man. I don't I don't what is that? What's that little bubble? Oh, and I put my thumbs up and I got two thumbs up. Now I got fireworks, man. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Bro. I bet you can do it too. Over there. Yeah. Um, but no, you reminded me during the first couple of years of uh, doing longer fasts, I also would get some detoxification teas. They're just herbal teas with different ingredients. Again, I can't um, <clears throat> promote any of them. Like, yes, it was nice to have something other than just water at times. And because it's herbal, there's no caffeine. It didn't break my fast unless you're one of the people in my comments who says that I broke a fast because it's not water. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know the particular ingredients in there, um, but there are detoxification teas and check out some of the ingredients that Chris dropped in the comments there as well. I'm sure. Like you said, though, test them out, see if they help. I learned a lot about what works for me and what doesn't work for me with fasting by trying it out myself. You know, like I went through a time where I was listening to people who were saying, you know, you can still like you could drink diet soda and you can, you know, drink calorie free beverages. And I would put Mio energy in my water. And what I learned by doing that was, yeah, the weight loss was still the same, but it actually made me hungrier because mm. the flavoring actually triggered my appetite. So it made the fasting easier for the first like 30 minutes. But then after drinking it, it made the next couple of hours way harder because I had to fight against hunger even more than I probably would have. But I wouldn't have known that hadn't I done it because I've met plenty of people that are like, yeah, I drink, you know, diet beverages while I fast and it makes it easier. And I'm like, okay, this, you do you, right? And, and listen, this goes back to what we were saying earlier. If, if that's what you feel though, that you need to do when you fast to like do the fast, Hey, I'm all for it because you're probably drinking that stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah. However, I would not I would not teach people drink Diet Coke on your fast. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of negative drawbacks to drinking Diet Coke on your fast. And if you don't feel like you just need it to get through, I wouldn't do it. And yeah. or, you know, if you're open to other options, I'm gonna give you those other options before we say, yeah, Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not at the top of my list of of things that you should be drinking on a fast, but depending on who you ask, you can. Okay, Ricardo asked, doesn't skin type determine if you will have loose skin, such as a soily, dry, normal skin, etc.? Also, having a lot of stretch marks can determine your success with loose skin, in my opinion. Um, 
before I pitch this back to you, Chris, the, this is interesting to me because like, again, yeah, like it's going to depend on, you know, on a person by person, individual basis. When it comes to the second part of that though, having a lot of stretch marks, I actually do have stretch marks, right? I don't have any loose skin, but if you look closely, I do have stretch marks on the side of my cheeks here and right here um, because before I actually lost all the weight, I went up to about 185 pounds lifting weights and not eating good food. I talk about this a lot on my channel, <clears throat> how a lot of people I feel get this wrong because they're like, oh, I want to build muscle to boost my metabolism, but they don't change the types of foods that they're eating because this is what I did for two years. I ate just the same standard American diet that I had been eating when I was like 28 years old and I was lifting heavy weights and dude, I looked like a bulldog, but like a really <laughs> inflamed bulldog, you know, I'm five foot six, 185 pounds. And like, everything was stretched out. So when I did lose the weight, there are stretch marks, like I'm not going to whip them out here right now. But yeah, they're stretch marks, but I don't have extra loose skin. Like, yeah, I can, uh, like, this is my shirt right here. And I can grab like, we're talking like, there's no fat in there. It's just like, I'm grabbing a layer of skin. There's stretch marks there, but it's not um, you know, like flapping loose skin. Right. As far as the, you know, the skin type that I don't know, um, much about, have you read or learned anything about that? Mm -hmm. Well, first let me say this. When we talk about loose skin, it's important to be on the same page because everybody has their own opinion about what loose skin is. Right. I remember we, my brother and I, my, my other brother, John, we did a video about him losing uh, 50 pounds in two months or something like that with no loose skin. And no, it was six weeks. It was six weeks. And people were trying to say, no, he does have loose skin. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, bro, there's no loose skin. So loose skin is literally when you have like it's purely just skin. Right. There's no fat there. There's it's just skin. And it's it's typically will hang off your body. It's almost like wearing a shirt yeah. the way that you could pull your. You know, you could peel your shirt up. That's loose skin. It's not just having a little jiggly skin or it's not that like that's a level of it. But that's not the level we're talking about. Um, so as far as like skin type. If if it was do genetics play a role? Yes, genetics play a role, but it's typically it's typically not going to determine if you get loose skin or if you don't get loose skin, it might determine how quickly you get it or, you know, how quickly you can eliminate it or, you know, things of that nature. But it's not like if you have certain genetics, you are going to get loose skin. That's not it. Or or if you have certain genetics, you won't get loose skin. It's It really boils down to cellular hydration. So if you are more prone, genetically speaking, to loose skin and you have severe uh, cellular dehydration, you're probably going to get more loose skin than someone else. Yeah. But you're both going to get it, right? You're both are in the same boat. You're going to get it. I have seen people, because I, I would get comments about um, melanated people, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not getting loose skin when they lose weight, when they fast. And I'm like, but there's black people with loose skin, though. Yeah. Like, what are you talking <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not like we don't get loose skin. If you go right. on the internet, you can find plenty of, of black people who have lost weight, fitness, traditional route, and they have loose skin. Yeah. So... Um, people like to, people like to think, or at least the narrative that's being pushed is that genetics plays a huge role and it's not, it plays yeah. a small role actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. You're going to get, this is one of the, the rabbit trails that you and I get on because we, there's so many topics that we get fired up about, but yeah, this is something that I've been diving deep into recently, you know, because, you know, especially with Oprah's special that came out you know talking about obesity is genetic and it's a disease and and the thing that makes the most sense to me because you mentioned genetics playing a small role is an, and i do think that this is probably the route that you know <clears throat> medicine will eventually go into is the is the science of epigenetics right like we have like for example like y'all know if if you've seen either of our interviews before that I used to be a drug addict, right? Am I genetically 
like built to be a drug addict maybe right but there's plenty of people that likely have the same genetic predisposition to become an addict but they never become addicts because big big reveal here they never put <laughs> drugs in their body right <laughs> so like you've got these genetic predispositions and you can turn these genes on or off based on what you do what you put into your body how you interact with the world i think that's more important than I'm genetically prone to being overweight. Yeah, that might be true, but there's plenty of people who, you know, have been overweight and have lost that weight by changing their behaviors. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, listen, the science is changing. One here's one thing we gotta remember about science: it's ever evolving, right? Yeah. Like, there's never any concrete scientific fact because everything's a theory and we're just learning and we're practicing and we're figuring it out and we're this is the best this is our best understanding of it today and then 100 years from now we'll have a better understanding so it really gets annoying sometimes when people try to use science to like disprove what i'm saying and you know there's no journals to back up what you're saying and it's like i have real life anecdotal evidence which right. in my opinion is far superior to someone's theory yeah. There's nothing behind a theory, but at least I have the evidence. And it's like also when they do these trials and these these clinics and these things that are published in the journal, it's like this isn't real life. No, you're not dealing with real people in the real world. They're in sterile environments or there's particular parameters put a lot of times. It's not the same as just following Justin or Chris around and just seeing what happens. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, I think I think that it's disingenuous of the scientific community to make it seem as though like genetics are controlling everything. And if you guys want to learn more about it, I would say look at look at Dr. Bruce Bruce Lipton's work. Mm -hmm. I went to a uh, speech that he did back in um, 2020, maybe 2021, something like that, where he actually broke down how the protein um, influences the genetics versus the genetics influencing the protein which is what we've been taught so right. justin as you kind of alluded to your environment can influence your genetics yeah. and we we see this in really unique ways like if you date someone or you marry someone and you're around them too much you kind of yeah. start looking alike yeah you start um, looking like your dog if you just spend all your time with your dog <laughs> right so so we see the influence that it has and, and just in general there was a there was a kid he did a 13 year picture i think it was like he took pictures every day yeah. for 13 years or something you I saw that? that yeah it was incredible watching this guy like develop but you saw if you looked at him you saw his eyes shift yeah. you saw his nose move we are transformers our bodies are highly adaptable and we do have a lot of impact on how we look and interact in this environment with our thought process our friends and our environment yeah Okay. I had another thought, but I'm going to keep us moving forward here. I like this question. I drive limos and often lift heavy luggage. Would an extended water fast be feasible for me? <clears throat> um, this is really closely related to a question that I get very, very often, right? Can I still exercise while I'm fasting? I, my response to this usually is test it out and see how you feel um, because I've done fasts where I just want to focus on resting and fasting. So I will stop going to the gym. I'll maybe just do like walks because I still want to stay active and get things moving. Um, but I've also done longer fasts where I do go to the gym and I lift heavy weights, heavy weights for me. Remember I'm five foot six and small, so they might not be that heavy for you, but they're heavy for me and I've been completely fine. And Chris, would you disagree with any of that? No, the um, you know, once again, it goes back to what what are what are the outcomes you're looking to get? So, for example, if you are a stage, if you're stage four, you know, you have cancer or something. I'm gonna tell you to mm -hmm. stay at home, fast, rest, maybe go somewhere tropical. Like remove yourself from your environment, go somewhere where the air is a little healthier, right? We're going to go to the extreme. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're just looking, you all your markers are normal and you're just looking to lose some weight and you work and you do heavy lifting and stuff like that, fast. Take some juice with you. 
right? Take some uh, some fresh squeezed juice with you. And if you get yourself in a little bit of trouble, you get dizzy, you feel weak, you have some juice, yep. you know, and yep. everything in between. So that's really where your personal experimentation comes into play. It depends on what you want to achieve, uh, what outcomes you want and 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 what type of fast you're, you want to do. We have fasting purists, right? So when we talk about a pure water fast and you're talking about a fasting purist, you're going to struggle a little bit with ex- like, you know, extended fast and working and heavy lifting. Now, if you plan your fast a little bit better and you do a, a very clean preparation, yeah, you, you get a little bit more leeway. So it kind of just depends on how you guys want to approach it. But um, I would say if you're going to do this, you didn't prep, you just you just want to try it. You want to push yourself to that limit. Have get yourself a cooler with some fresh squeezed juice and, that's so and good. have that available because that'll pick you back up real quick if you need it. Yeah, that's so good because that's what I was about to say is just have that backup plan in place because best case scenario, you don't even need it. Worst case scenario, you need to like quickly down a few ounces of juice or, you know, I would go with juice, not Gatorade, but um And then you'll feel fine. You'll be able to lift that heavy luggage and finish out your day. And the next try might go even better than that one. Mm -hmm. That's great. This is good because I almost asked this too because I've heard this. If you're showering daily, is it still considered a dry fast? You literally just said, you know, extremist or elitist. What did you say? Purist? Purist? (laughs) <laughs> I've heard, you know, things. yeah, like if you're doing a dry fast, you can't shower because your skin technically can absorb some of the water. It's going to be a very, very small amount that it does. I personally, um, I w- wouldn't even worry about that. I would still shower. Um, but if you want to be, you know, I did the perfect seven day dry fast, then yeah, maybe you want to not shower. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that with the with the dry fasting, I like to look at things I like what does nature tell me? If you were dry fasting and you were living in, in nature, you're gonna come in contact with water. If it yeah. rained, I mean you're screwed. Humidity, you run. yeah. But the humidity. Um, but what I will say is this, and I think this is where the whole thing came from. Our city water is not like rainwater, it's not lake water, it's not na- any natural water. And when I was doing my dry fasting and I just did a soft dry is what they call it. I could feel the chemicals in the water. Mm. Like it was the first time I ever felt it before, but it was, it stimulated me. I, I could feel it. It, I was not, I would, I had to limit how my, sh- I was in and out as quick as I could. It was very uncomfortable actually. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, going back. So this is kind of what we were talking about probably 45 minutes ago. 21 day versus 30 day versus 40 day water fast. I know you said typically 21 days is what you push people towards doing. And because I'm I'm paraphrasing you now, because you haven't gotten a lot of people who go beyond 21 days, like you and I both know a couple people who have done that, but because not a lot of people go beyond that, you don't have a lot of like documented benefits beyond the 21 day mark. Um, Cause when is it again that the shrink week typically happens from day 14 to 21, that third week? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I've not done a 30 day or a 40 day fast myself. So I can't tell you one way or the other, which is better. I would say if you get it to 21 days though, man, you're crushing it. I, I would say that um, in the upper we go uh because i've done i've done like 30 day fast but i do um i do hybrid fasting so i'm gonna do water juice dry mm-hmm. let's just say 10 days of each that's what i'll do during that that 30 days and my brother john did uh he might have did uh 36 or 37 days my brother steve you know right around that 40 day mark one thing i noticed just from people that did do it like online there is a release of what they call the mucoid plaque that happens in those upper days. Like, you know, we're talking probably 36 days, 35 days to 40 days. Um, you tend to start releasing when you have your bowel movements. Mm. They, they happen differently. 
Because, you know, you're 40 days into a fast. Yeah. You're like, what am I pooping out at this? Yeah, point? there's nothing in there. Yeah, you're you're this. There's it's this mucus that hardens and becomes it mixes with the synthetic foods and things we eat, the minerals and stuff we take in. And it creates it's almost like a tube. Mm. And and then it, it the body starts breaking it down. The bile fluid will start breaking it down and it eventually releases. And it, it feels it can even feel like like a mucus snake. Just like mm -hmm. a, it's yeah. like imagine a snake made of mucus coming out yeah. or some people have actual hard pieces, almost like rubber come out. Yeah. So those types of releases typically happen in those upper days. I had one happen, but I was using the herbs and the herbs helped do it in under 30 days. So that's the difference between like a pure fast using herbs, you know, or detox tea specifically for detoxification, you can speed up results. Interesting. See, now this is after I talked with Pastor Idleman, and now after this, I'm like, man, now I need to push myself to do a 40 day fast. I've never experienced some <laughs> of these stranger things. I got to experience them myself. Yes. Um, Gamer Dad asks, does water fasting help with someone who snores? The first thing that popped into my head here is the the thing that I tell pretty much every single one of the guys that I've coached in the last seven years when they ask me if they think that uh, they have sleep apnea. <clears throat> and I'm like, you know, nine times out of 10, sleep apnea is caused by being overweight, having extra body fat that your body doesn't need to be holding on to. And nine times out of 10, when you lose weight, the sleep apnea goes away. And the number one you know, symptom of sleep apnea is snoring. So my, my just common sense answer to would water fasting help with someone who snores? Yeah. If your snoring is due to being a little bit overweight, then yes, fasting is going to help you lose that weight and your snoring will probably go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry. I, so <laughs> I, your, um, your screen's been freezing a little bit. Oh, I, really? No. Is your is, is your signal? I don't know if it's my signal or yours. To be honest, no, it could be mine. But, I'm not um, sure. I got full signal, but my computer does wonky things sometimes. Okay, okay, it, it could be mine. That's why I had reset my my internet because right. it just hadn't been reset in a while. But it ended up jumping to my other uh, internet anyway. Um, so yes, yeah, sleep apnea is one of those things that we see resolved through through the process of fasting very regularly, actually. Yeah. So, um, yes, it's going, it's, I mean, we've seen it happen many, many times. You can, um, you can also use essential oils to help. I mean, look, fasting is a great tool, but it's not the end all be all. There's ways to like, uh, bolster the effects of fasting. So there is a, there's an oil called breathe that doTERRA makes. doTERRA is the essential oil company yeah. we use. They have a therapeutic grade. It's rigorously tested like they're pure oils and they're very potent and, you know, put a little uh, breathe in the diffuser. Um, I would also do a little lavender on the bottom of the feet and maybe on the bed linen and um, I would fast as well. And, you know, within a week or so, you'll you'll probably find that you're not dealing with that anymore. Now, as a permanent solution, yes, you want to get the weight off. You want to get to a healthy weight, you know, things of that nature. But I think that if we understand that obviously what we're doing is beneficial and then, you know, you don't want to stop just because your problem seems to be resolved. Mm. You do have to continue to keep going. But it's like, hey, if we if we deal with sleep apnea, let's stop it as quickly as possible. And then let's because I'll say this. Um, the way that you lose your weight is actually through your breath. Yeah. So if you're not breathing well then your weight loss is going to be stifled. Right. So improving your breath is important. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. <clears throat> How does fasting affect your eyes? I've noticed a change in my vision over time, a year. And so that's the first question. Second question is, does dry fasting dry out your eyes? Maybe I'm not drinking enough water. I do know I've talked to several people who have noticed their vision has improved over time, like their prescription for their glasses or their contact lenses. They've actually gone the opposite direction than normal because of fasting and changing their diet as well. Um, I don't know about the 
and I don't know if that's specifically what you're asking here, if it's more in line with the second part of the question is just dry fasting, dry your eyes out and affect your vision negatively. Chris, do you know, have you experienced anything like that? I have not experienced fasting drying my eyes out or anything of that nature. I did get a slight improvement on the my eyes when I started fasting. Um, I have myopia, so mm. it depends on the type of eye issue that you have, what type of improvement you're going to see just from like just fasting alone. If you have like glaucoma or cataracts or um, blindness due to like diabetes and things of that nature, you're going to see extreme benefits from fasting. I mean, it's going to seem, oh, I cured my eyes. Yeah, that, That's where you hear those stories. Myopia is a little different because myopia is like a warping of the eyes and it comes from, um, you know, the, 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 the eyes being constantly strained. You really got to relax the eyes. And then when you put the glasses on, the glasses strain. Anyway, the point is, yeah, you can see benefit. It depends on what's really, what's really uh, causing the issue. But dry fasting is not going to dry your eyes out. Uh, if that's, you know, the, that question, it's not going to dry your eyes. Yeah. Okay. V love, which fast is better for arthritis, water fasting or dry fasting? I, I mean, don't. yeah, I'd say either. I would go dry, with water fasting. Dry fasting yeah. is probably going to do it faster. Faster. But you know the thing the thing that's important to realize is first of all fasting is not a complete it's not a it's like it's not a panacea so you got to be careful you could dry fast and your hands feel great and you go back to your habits and your hands start having issues again right so it's a, it's a lifestyle change but I always tell people if you can dry fast and you're really good at that and you could be consistent do that if you're yeah. more consistent with water do the water but they'll both work yeah yeah, that's a good point. Do what you can. I thought this was interesting because so she says she experienced extreme itching on her palms day four of a dry fast. Then it spread to her back, limbs and feet, drank water and started a liver flush. Skin is like silk now, except for the hands. Hands are now peeling. I had a really good friend of mine do one of those liver detoxes. Um, like uh, they got it from Thrive or something. And he did too much, uh, uh, like too high of a dose. He didn't taper himself into it. And that's what happened. He got these really itchy, um, almost looked like, like this really bad rash in between his fingers. And it was his liver detoxifying things too quickly. Like the skin is your largest detoxification organ. So anytime, like when I fast, do long fast, like I get raccoon eyes because my skin is like pushing out all these toxins. Um, so if you overdo it, if you've got a lot of built up toxins, then yeah, I think that's essentially what you experience here. Um, the hands are peeling. That's probably just the, you know, the repercussions of flushing those toxins out so quickly. Yep. I tell people all the time. You know, dry fasting is incredible, but be prepared for the detox yeah. symptoms. It is more intense. Um, and so the way you kind of mitigate that is, OK, so Justin, you had mentioned root products earlier. I usually will recommend people to get restore. 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 Yeah. Restore is a great uh, product to utilize before you start fasting and then also clean slate. Clean slate and restore would be great if if you kind of like get this all the time and you kind of know this is going to be the thing. I would get those, you know, you just use them. They're daily supplements, but you can specifically use them before you're about to start fasting just to help, help give you a lighter detox. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is because clean slate actually removes blockages in your system, heavy metals, you know, uh, allergens, pesticides, things of that nature. It removes it restore helps open up the elimination pathways so elimination pathways when you start fasting you're detoxing you're eliminating and it helps to open those pathways up so you can eliminate more efficiently and it'll decrease your detox symptoms yeah i have to get you to drop those links in the comments for anyone who's interested here okay ray asked does fasting heal congestive heart failure Hmm. I don't know the answer to that one, Chris. Do you? I actually have an interview on my channel. Um, I I think 
I can't remember if the interview is with the person who actually reversed it or if it was with their mother. But um, yeah, I had someone on the channel. I believe it was them. They had congestive heart failure and they did um, reverse it through through fasting and dietary strategy. Okay? okay, so it's not just fasting. And this is I mean, I'm going to keep saying it. You have to also it's a lifestyle thing. But if you if you're dealing with congestive heart failure, you should be looking for a lifestyle change because your lifestyle got you to where you are. Right. So you got to change the lifestyle anyway. You know, fasting could buy you some time. Right. But that is that what you want to do or do you want to actually resolve the problem? Right. I just dropped that link in the comment to to your video um, on congestive heart failure and fasting. Jeez, that was fast. Oh, man. It's what I do. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. OK. My doctor has me on antibiotics for the next 14 days. Is it crazy to fast while taking antibiotics? I feel for you because I've been on antibiotics for like two months of this year so far because I had like two surgeries back to back and then two weeks ago I came down with a cold and it turned into a sinus infection that wouldn't the cough wouldn't go away so <clears throat> my digestive system's all screwed up um I and, and this is a tricky question too because like oftentimes they tell you to take antibiotics with food so that you don't get diarrhea um last week while I was on seven days of antibiotics I don't eat breakfast. I take the antibiotics in the morning and in the evening. And I was only eating between the hours of 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. And I didn't have any more diarrhea than I would normally have taking antibiotics because that's what they do to you. Um, so, but again, this was just intermittent fasting. This wasn't a, an extended fast. I don't know how your body would respond to you know, just doing water, for example, if it would exacerbate the uh, symptoms. Um, I, I, my, I guess, like, I play it safe here. Like, if the prescribed directions say to take it with food, then maybe just take it with food. And when you finish the 14 days, just jump into the fasting. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you if you are utilizing uh, antibiotics, there's a couple ways you can approach this. Well, first, we just I just dropped the link to the root products. Um, if you use Clean Slate, Clean Slate will actually boost the effectiveness of any medications you're taking or herbal supplements. So that's one thing. But um, yeah, play you could play it safe. I mean, you could just mono fast like there's so many fasting methods and i think we get stuck on water fasting or intermittent fasting because that's those are the popular things mm -hmm. but if you're on the if you're on the antibiotics maybe just do mono fasting and mono fasting is just where you're where you, you're gonna eat but when you eat right you're gonna eat to take your medication you eat a whole food product with it instead of like something processed or mm -hmm. you know uh, something cooked you just get like a, a whole food product and then that way you have something on your stomach that'll help mitigate the negative impact of taking the antibiotics. And then you'll, you'll get right back into fasting because the body's able to digest that stuff very quickly. Boom, you're right back into fasting and you lose very little benefit. Yeah. Yeah, there's always something. I was literally writing this for my newsletter this morning. Like there's always something that we can do. Um, so I was writing this about how I had just started this new workout routine and then I got sick starting in the fourth week and it just destroyed me because in the past when I was much dumber and younger, I would still go to the gym and work out and it would just prolong the illness. It would just make it last twice as long. So I intentionally took a step back. It's so like, okay, I'm not going to the gym to work out while I'm sick, but that doesn't mean that I just stop everything and give up and wait until things get better. Like there's still something that I can do. I can still focus on, am I eating the right foods to fuel my body so that when this cold gets pushed out of my system, I can get right back into the gym, not having lost any ground. Right. And I think that's what you're saying is like, there's always something you can do. Like if you're forced to eat food on these antibiotics, choose some good foods, make some adjustments. And when those 14 days are up, man, then you can start fasting. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think that it's, I think it's important to understand what antibiotics are. So like, um, if you break down the word antibiotic, you yeah. have anti and bio, right? So you have against life. Yep. So what antibiotics do is they 
they kill off the microorganisms in your in your system. Mm -hmm. And what what we're essentially trying to do is create balance where there isn't balance. Right. Right. So the whatever symptoms you're dealing with, um, oftentimes when we're taking antibiotics, it's an imbalance, you know, a bacterial or viral or, you know, like there's some type of imbalance there with the microorganisms. And so you kill off the the microorganisms and then you just hope that the healthy the good ones yeah. are the ones that come back yeah um and and that's also why you have probiotics probiotics yeah. kind of like the other side of the spectrum <laughs> where you're trying to nourish certain bacteria or certain microorganisms but both it both instances create a balancing act that's hard to maintain yeah so i saw somebody in the chat said if hitler um yeah i saw some, that too. take antibiotics yeah i mean if listen, if you when you take antibiotics, it destroys your microbiome. Yeah. Like it's 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 look, I get it. We got to take them. I understand. I'm not, you know, do what you got to do. Just understand you have work to do to kind of start restoring the microbiome. And there's a there's a study that says that it takes up to seven years yeah. to recover from taking a round of antibiotics. Yeah. Like depending on how long, right? It depends on how long you're on them, but that's kind of like the extreme side of it, obviously. Yeah. But, um, you know, you just gotta be intentional about putting the, the healthy, the, the foods that are gonna nourish the bacteria in the gut and help get that stuff back in alignment. Yeah, and you reminded, I laughed when you said it because like I pointed to the bottle, like this is the second round of probiotics now that, I've on, that I'm on this year um, because, and I'm not somebody who takes probiotics regularly, but mm -hmm. I take them after antibiotics because dude, my, my system gets so jacked up. You made me think it's just like chemo, right? Like, Oh, you've got these cells that are out of control. Let's kill everything and hope that the <laughs> healthy ones come and grow back. And yeah, yeah un unfortunately, I, it causes... I think it's important for people to understand that because, because then you might take a different route. Like yeah. there are, listen, it's a lot of work. I know it's trust me. It's my job to find these alternatives. It's a lot of work, but there's always an alternative. Yeah. You got to remember that. And, you know, we're going to make our decisions. We're going to, depending on our life and what time we have and what resources we have. But um, there's there's always a natural solution that won't just eradicate your whole gut or whatever. Um, and it might not be as convenient, but um, it's out there. Yeah. Let's see here. Isaiah says, what did y'all do about the, <laughs> what is that, a tongue? I need help. I'm on day three. Do you know what that is? Is that hunger? <laughs> Detox tongue. Oh. Is that a tongue? Yeah, it looks like it. Like looks it. like a tongue. This is my dog's tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, is that detox tongue or is that hunger? It's an interesting little little meme there or yeah. uh whatever well i guess i'll just say with the detox tongue i'm you know i i hate to sound like a broken record but i just talk about what's worked the clean slate tends to work really well for detox tongue mm. before i found clean slate and talked about clean slate i would recommend getting some food grade hydrogen peroxide uh, you want to dilute it down to like three percent and then you get yourself a copper tongue scraper and then you can also use like you know mint essential oil in your water or something like that or you could just use fresh mint and kind of like deburr your mouth with that um and you know people people liked that some people were like ah it's not really working for me but we've had we've heard some really good results like my brother steve who would do the long um fast and listen detox tongue it has levels yeah. So when you're fasting for 14 days, detox tongue, that's going to be different from three day de detox tongue, 14 day detox tongue will make you want to quit. Like you're doing well, but that detox tongue. And he told me that from using clean slate, he doesn't get detox tongue anymore. So, you know, yeah, lots of benefits. All right, Chris, you good on time here? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, Keisha, what should I do if I get a headache while dry fasting since I can't drink electrolytes or take in any salt? Uh, see, I, I know Chris's content so well that I already know his answer for this. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we we were talking earlier. I guess Chris Chris was talking earlier about essential oils. Essential oils can can really help with the short term. I think you recommend peppermint. Um, there's one called. Uh, so you were saying DoTerra. I'm sure there's a. So like the stuff that I have is Young Living, but I, I'm yep, sure Young DoTerra. Living doTERRA makes a similar product to the one that young living makes called breathe or maybe that is doTERRA's brand breathe that stuff works wonders for my allergies by the way but mm. that's mainly peppermint in there that opens up my sinuses and it'll take your headache away at least in the short term for sure yeah, yeah i mean you know put a little um you could put them on your temple you could you know put a drop put some on your temples put some on the back of your neck you know what i mean maybe a little behind your ears or whatever uh, works pretty fast. Yeah. But, but this is what I was saying earlier with like, like the, when we were talking about antibiotics, there's always like a natural solution because science just mimics nature anyway. Um, I find that like when you use the essential oils, they work really fast. There's really like no side effect. Yeah. And they usually work better than the the medication. I know too. This, so this isn't when I was dry fasting, but when I was water fasting and I would get tired or I'd get headaches. Even this is my hack for if I get a wave of hunger that seems overwhelming and I can't stop thinking about food. My solution, my number one solution is to go for a walk because it just mm. gets things moving and it starts to detoxify you quicker. And yeah, I mean, if you haven't done that and given that a shot yet, try that and see if that doesn't push that headache out quicker. Yeah. Yeah. On that, along the same lines. I mean, when you're walking, you're breathing, right? You're breathing more deeply. Breathing exercises are so underrated when it yeah. comes to fasting. It's not even funny. Like in a, in a traditional manner, breathing exercises, would be a regular part of your fast. It'd be a regular part of your daily routine. But nowadays we're so disconnected breathing exercise. We're like, you know, we don't know nothing about that. Yeah. Um, so walking is going to help to get you to breathe more deeply. You know, you're going to get more oxygen in. And remember, you can, you can ox, you can alkaline, alkalize your system instantaneously by doing breathing exercises. Uh, so yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good point. Brittany, thank you. You are too kind. Appreciate you. Here we Much go. The Moosey Show. Can you tell me any good advice for when you hit plateaus? I'm down from 325 to 270. First of all, congrats on that. That's great. Oh, it's yeah. like my body doesn't want to go lower than that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's awesome. First, celebrate that like 55 pounds down. I don't that's... get the fireworks. You don't get them? They're right here. Here you go for the Moosey Show. Oh, oh, nope. They're gone. They're gone. <laughs> they don't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's jumped on recently is like, what's wrong with this guy? What is he doing? <laughs> um, no, anyway, so congrats on the 55 pounds. That's great. Um, without, you know, knowing the specifics, uh, it's kind of tough to to tell you what – you could do to go lower than that. But this is something that I encounter with a lot of the people that I've coached, right? Like they hit plateaus and I can tell you what, why it typically occurs. Um, number one could be if you're sticking with the same fasting schedule consistently, like say you're just doing OMADs or you're doing rolling 48s or whatever it is, if it's consistent and it's gotten you down to 270 and now like you're still continuing to do it and nothing else has changed, which is a, by the way, a big caveat, if nothing else has changed and you're still sticking at that weight, then you might just need to change your fasting schedule. And that will give you a little bit of a boost to that weight loss. Again, the other thing that I've seen that typically happens when somebody hits a plateau is they start to, and I'm not saying this for you, right? Because I don't know your specifics of just saying this in general. And, and I've done this too is uh, you start to make compromises in other areas. So if we're talking about, you know, weight loss being on, you know, the two main levers of fasting and what you eat. So when you eat and what you eat, typically like the more I fast and I start to see results, then I'll start to, you know, fudge a little more on what I eat. And essentially like I start to overeat or I'm eating the wrong types of foods and my weight loss then starts to plateau. Again, like, you don't have to change what you eat that much as long as you ramp up the the fasting. But if you want the best results, I always say like, if you want the best of the best, right? What did you say? Better is better, right? Better ramp better. them both up. Ramp them both up. Um, 
So that's the, that, those would be my thoughts on that. You got it. What's this one that you starred here, Chris? Oil pull yeah. to keep the month healthy. I wanted to I wanted um to highlight this because we were talking about the detox tongue. So yeah. this is an excellent um therapy for the detox tongue, but but just in general, because you're when you're oil pulling, essentially you're you're just basically you're taking like a carrier oil, you do coconut oil or olive oil or whatever kind of you could do castor oil if you really want to be a G. And <laughs> you're <laughs> <laughs> Castor oil is a yeah. well, clean you um, out too if you swallow that stuff, man. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's incredible for everything. Like castor oil, what's wrong with you? You castor oil, but um, <laughs> it'll it'll extract the toxins from your mouth because you know your your mouth is extremely close to your your brain. The blood is flowing through your mouth, so it'll pull the toxins out of the blood. And then you just usually you oil pull for like 17 to 20 minutes. If you use castor oil, you can cut the time down. It works. It's a little bit more efficient. Um, but you want to make sure to spit it out when you're finished. Do not ever swallow yeah. it yeah. Uh, because you're just basically reabsorbing everything that you just pulled out. Yeah. Uh, but it'll make your teeth whiter. It'll make your gums healthier. It will help balance the pH in your mouth. And it will help with that detox tongue. That's a great uh, uh, therapy. Yeah, Joel has a comment here. This is this is exactly what I was talking about. This is what I've seen happen for most of the the people that I've coached. OMAD and for me too, like I did 28 days straight of OMAD and that's exactly what I was talking about. For me personally what it was is I started compromising on my refeeding, you know, meal, my one meal because the longer I did OMAD back back to back day by day, I got hungrier and hungrier. And so I would yeah. then eat more and more. And so after about two and a half weeks, like I stopped losing that much weight. And that's when I then moved into the longer fasts. Mm -hmm. What do you think about watching fasting videos and not, and not practicing? Are you training yourself to ignore information and desensitizing yourself to fasting motivation? That's an intriguing thought. I like the the depth of this thought. I mean, I'm always, I, what is it Very you say at the end of your videos, Chris? Knowledge without application. The application of knowledge. Yeah. The application of knowledge is power. Yeah. Yeah. So w what do we think about watching fasting videos and not practicing? My, I mean, like, we all have so much knowledge these days. Like, we can literally type into Google or YouTube how to do something and learn how to do it. But until you actually do it, like, what is it? Like, knowledge without application is nothing. Um, whether or not you're desensitizing yourself to fasting motivation, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that would probably be individualized. But I personally find, like, the motivation to fast – Yes, I get motivation from watching other people do hard things, but I get the most motivation from doing hard things myself. You know, mm -hmm. like that's what motivates me is, you know, you finish a five day fast and then you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, at the beginning of this, I didn't think I was going to be able to do this. And I just proved to myself that I could do it. I wonder what else I could do now. That's mm -hmm. where the motivation comes from. So, yeah, watch the fasting videos, but at some point, like, you have to stop learning and you just have to start doing. Yeah, I think mindset is it plays a huge role in this. Just kind of piggybacking off what you said. It's going to this is definitely an individual thing. I um, I didn't I didn't have I, I want to say I didn't watch like a lot of fasting content or read fasting books. Um, I want to say that there just wasn't a lot of it available, even if I wanted to. But I probably still would not have because. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm motivated by doing. I'm motivated. I'm motivated by experiencing. And it was an intriguing like I learned a therapy that could uh, we'll just say improve cancer, improve diabetes, improve high blood pressure, improve all these things. I was fascinated. So I wanted to I wanted to experience now. What I have seen is people have been watching my content. They've been on the channel just watching for a year or even two years, and they never really did anything. And then all of a sudden this year, they'll be like, hey, I'm I'm joining a challenge or I'm doing right. 
So sometimes people need that time to work up courage, mm -hmm. to work up, uh, maybe they need to learn. I do encourage, like when you're brand new, like learn. Yeah. You don't have to dive head in first, yeah. like learn, right? Yeah. There's a lot of great information available now to help you avoid certain pitfalls. Yeah. You know, if you want to do some like supplementation, if you want to just really knock it out of the park, you can sit and learn for, you know, two, three months or whatever the case may be and absorb and then come up with a strategy and apply that. Yeah. Yeah. It comes down to knowing yourself too, right? Like, I think I told you this before, Chris, but I'm like a why person, right? Not everybody's wired like that, but there's lots of people that are. But like, when I learn something new, I have to understand why, like, why should I do this? Why does this actually work? The first time, this is what I told you. I think the first couple of times I ever heard Jason Fung, like I was still a personal trainer. And, uh, and so I was taught, you know, the calories in calories out, fasting's bad for you. I thought Jason Fung was like, I didn't think he knew what he was talking about. I thought he was insane. Right. <laughs> and it took like hearing his stuff and other people's stuff for a couple of months before it's finally started to click and make sense. Be like, wait a minute, there is actually something to this. Right. So yeah, know yourself, like learn up until the point where you feel like, okay, I know as much as I can possibly know for the place that I'm at right now. And then take that step of faith and start doing it because you're going to learn so much more by actually doing it too you know mm -hmm. Ooh, that i like that that's a good one where do you stand on how important exercise is along with the diet Ooh, i could probably talk about this for an hour say, this one's yours. Yours <laughs> right here. all right so let me give you the unbiased kind of both sides of it exercise is important but not for weight loss specifically so exercise is very important because obviously it's good for your overall health it's also very motivating a lot of people when they start going to the gym or they start a new exercising program they automatically start eating better as well because it's like i'm not going to put all of this hard work in at the gym and then go ruin it all by you know going to mcdonald's and eating you know 12 big macs so it is very important. There's also a lot of good research that strength training wow. is, is really good for insulin resistance, right? Like it, it can improve your insulin sensitivity within your muscles, which, you know, there is some research that shows that that's separate from the other systems of your body in terms of insulin resistance. But all of that being said, when it comes to purely weight loss, you know, people say 85% diet, 15% exercise. I literally say like 95% diet, 5% exercise. In terms of burning more calories, what happens 90% of the time is when you start exercising more, it increases the hormones that are responsible for your hunger. So you're going to become hungrier. And if your diet is not dialed in and not dealt with yet, it's going to you're never going to be able to out exercise. I mean, you've heard that too. You can't out exercise a poor diet. So mm. that's my long winded both sides of the <laughs> exercise with diet. Fix the diet first because most of the guys that I've coached in the last seven years, like they don't even exercise until three months in. They mm. lose all of their weight just with fasting. And then they start exercising because by that, by then, they have their fasting figured out. They have their nutrition figured out. Now they can tack on the extra habit that's going to increase their hunger, but they're going to be fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll say this too. This is just a tidbit. The, uh, the fat, the, uh, when it comes to exercise, like building muscle, it really does help with mental mm -hmm. issues as well. Yeah. Like um, they're finding out, I can't remember what they call it, miracle hormone or something some weird oh i know. need a miracle hormone where's that yeah, one <laughs> yeah it's, that, that's literally what they call it's like miracle hormone or something that uh that they found in muscles when that it's released in muscles when you work out when you exercise yeah. so there is a great benefit to your mental health yeah. exercising yeah. so i just want to add that but once again i i 100 agree with you justin when it comes to weight loss it's you know yeah well, yeah. And I mean, take myself as an example for the last year up until a month ago, I didn't exercise at all. Like, yes, I went hiking and yes, I did walks, but I didn't go to the gym. I wasn't doing any hit training. I wasn't running. I wasn't doing cardio aside from walking and my weight didn't change. Right. Because I was still focusing on what I was eating 
and when I was eating. So I was using intermittent fasting to control my weight. But again, on the flip side, my mental health and my energy were much lower when I was not exercising versus where it is now that I am exercising again. Can water fasting cure fatty liver? I'm just nodding. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So can changing easy. what you're eating too. Right. And it depends on how quickly you want to do it. But like the thing is, it's not always about the speed. It's about a, being efficient. So if you if if you were to go from like a standard American diet, which is what caused you to have fatty liver more than anything, like it right. used to be what alcohol, but yeah. now it's like just eating. Um, you change it. Let's say you go from standard American to raw food, which is like the most extreme jump you can make. Will it reverse your fatty liver? Yeah, but yep. also how sustainable is that? Yeah, you know. Yeah. So creating a transitional diet is super important. Um, that's why combining fasting with diet helps a lot because then you can kind of moderately approach both without yeah. feeling like this isn't sustainable right. or, you know, I'm not able to eat what I want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and it makes the fasting easier too. You know, if you're not eating all of those processes, especially the processed carbohydrates that are spiking your blood sugar and causing it to crash, like the fasting so much easier. I've done so many difficult fasts because I ate crappy food on Sunday and started fasting on Monday. I push through it, but it's easier if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Joel asked, do you think the value of fasting decreases after 48 hours? Um, I think it probably increases after 48 hours, in all honesty. 48 hours, I've found, and Chris, you're nodding because you probably experienced the same thing. 48 hours is when it actually starts to get easier. And it's also like beyond 24 hours is where you're, you'll get into autophagy and really start to experience the like the really good effects. You're definitely in ketosis after 24 hours. A lot, you know, the research that they have on autophagy says that it seems to start around 24 hours. So by the time you get to 48 hours, um, the, the hunger hormones have decreased. They're not going to increase as much as they do during those first. I find the first 48 hours the toughest, you know? So I'd say if you could push beyond 48 hours, like probably find day four and five easier than day two or three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm sure this question comes from there's some fasting guru or intermittent fasting guru on there on YouTube talking about the benefits of 48 hour fasting. Uh, your human growth hormone skyrockets uh, leading up to that 48 hour mark. And so depending on like what, what, who you're learning from, like if it's a fitness guy or whatever, they're probably going to like really hone in on that. And, and people are going to preach. There's not much benefit after 40 hours because there's science to back up any belief that you have. But the reality is they're not pushing beyond 48 hours themselves. Yeah. So they don't see the benefit because they're not doing it, you know, and it just gets more increasingly difficult in their mind, especially if you've never done five days. Yeah. Like, Leading up to day three is usually when people have the most difficulty. Mm -hmm. If you get past day four, you get into day five, you know, upwards day eight, around between day, I would say four and day 10, you can almost experience a euphoric event where you just feel really good. You feel well, your mind is clear. Like it's a very interesting flicker of how you can be in a non-toxic state. And I think it's it's much appreciated. But if you've never got to experience it, you don't understand the benefit of fasting longer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, fasting actually increases benefit with time. Yeah. And it depends on where your focus is, whether or not you're even going to notice it. Because you like you might think, well, Chris, I'm looking for weight loss. Well, if you're looking for weight loss, you actually lose less weight the longer you fast. Yeah. So then you might be like, oh, it's not as beneficial. But. If you want holistic wellness, yeah, your spiritual enlightenment goes through the roof after 14 days. Yeah. You know, um, if you're looking for mental clarity, you you want to be sharper. You want to be, you know, uh, just be able to make decisions better. You want to, you know, maybe you're dealing with emotional things with your, your spouse or whatever. Totally. You'll get that clarity after day 10, you know. 
um, you start getting up into the 21 days and the 30 days, different things happen. We talked about the shrink week earlier. So it's there's benefit the longer you fast. You just get different benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And I just saw the comment from Joel say DeLauer says after 48, it goes down, which I think um, like I like Thomas DeLauer, um, but I think that's on point with what you were saying. Like if you're, he's he's very, you know, much into keeping a lot of muscle mass on his body. So he's going to be fasting in order to, like you said, increase human growth hormone, lift weights right after breaking that 48 hour fast or right before, because that's when your human growth hormone is going to be the highest. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested, I, but I know too, that Thomas DeLauer has done fasts that are longer than 48 hours, but I think that's probably what he sticks with, um, yeah, as I his mean, bread and butter for his program. Yeah. Look, look, look at his brand. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like it's, it's important to like, when you take information from a particular creator or influencer, you got to look at the brand. Um, the Lauer is a brand. Mm -hmm. Okay. First and foremost, you know? So, um, there's, there's a certain narrative. He has sponsorships. Yeah. He brings in a lot of money from them, sponsorships. So he's going to focus. And I'm, I'm not saying that the information is wrong, it may not be the right information based on the question you're asking though. Like, but if your goal is in alignment with what his brand goal is, then yeah, you might find that there isn't much benefit after 48 hours. Yeah. Like if you want to maximize muscle growth and, and stay super lean, then 48 hour fasts might be your sweet spot. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some tips for starting a water fast for people who work? I can fast when I have time off, but during the week, it's almost distracting. Should I take days off when starting? That's a good question. Chris, do you have an answer for that? Right. So when you, when you work, okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to take account of your experience with fasting up until this point. You should, if you're doing like three days or four days, if you're doing longer fast, you should have an idea of when things get rocky for you. Yeah. Maybe you could do one or two days and you're, it's, it's annoying, but you could do it, right? You got your energy and stuff like that. Maybe day three is really hard. So take an account of what you've experienced. And then what I usually recommend is utilize the weekends, right? As your, as your friend. So if you know that you can fast, let's just say that two days. If you're working and you're fasting for two days, you could do that. Like it's annoying, but you could do it. Well, then I would say start fasting on Thursday. You fast Thursday, you fast Friday. You have two work days that you're fasting. Then you get two more days where you're just at home. It's the weekend. So you could actually do a four day fast. Yeah. You can you could get the benefit of a longer fast, but then you get to rest during the days where it's the most critical for you. And then you get to start the week off with your refeed. So you get your energy back and you're good and you're working Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday Wednesday, and then Thursday you hit your fast again. Boom. I'm just smiling because that's wisdom bombs right there. Like I, <laughs> that's, that's perfect. That's exactly what um, I experienced myself. So like there's certain tasks that I'm horrible at when I'm fasting, especially yeah. after 48 hours. So like I'm not great at coaching because I can't focus and pay attention. It's very hard for me to focus on one person as it is when I'm not fasting. And so that's what I do is like, if I'm going to be editing all day on Monday, I know that I can fast and edit, right? So maybe I should start my fast on Saturday so that Sunday's day one, Monday, the editing day is day two. And then Tuesday, if I have to do a bunch of coaching calls, I break my fast and I'm fine for that. So yeah, it really comes down to looking at your schedule, figuring out what works for works best for you. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant. What are the benefits of fasting when it comes to menopause symptoms? Asking for the feminine community. <clears throat> I noticed someone else mentioned Mindy Peltz has a lot on menopausal stuff too. I know she's big on fasting. Um, yeah, because I don't know. I, I personally haven't done a lot <laughs> of research. I don't have any experience with <laughs> menopause, nor have I done a lot of uh, research on menopausal symptoms. The the only, the literally the, the only thing I know about um, fasting and menopause is when it comes to intermittent fasting, like once you're um, post-menopausal, uh, you don't really have to worry about doing the same intermittent fasting schedule because it really won't, you know, mess with your hormones like it would if you were pre-menopausal. But I don't know 
what the benefits of fasting would be to menopausal symptoms? I would say, um, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record. I said it the last time. I mean, get yourself a bottle of clean slate. If you're pre-menopause, get a bottle of clean slate. So here's what I learned from researching heavy metals. Menopause is um, your body releasing heavy metals from the bones into the, the system, into the body. So like as you as you collect heavy metals, you know, you, you, you're eating off a fork, lead paint or, you know, um, lead in the air and in the soil and stuff like that. Whatever. We, we ingest these uh, inorganic materials, these heavy metals. The body doesn't have a great system for extracting that, especially considering the fallen state that we're in. We've taken a lot of processed foods. So the body will store it places for the time being. For women, it just tends to be that it'll store things like lead in the bones. Um, now, when it, when it comes out during the menopause time, uh, you're going to see a, a huge hormonal imbalance. A clean slate is literally designed to help encapsulate that material and usher it out the body. Um, also, you do get cavitations in the bone, right? They're they're microscopic, but they 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 exist, which is why uh, bone structure becomes more brittle or becomes more easily to fracture. You know, you see a lot of women dealing with like hips and you know breaking hips and things of that nature. Um, so you do need to replace the minerals. You want to you want to kind of like replace those minerals that that should be in those cavitations. So clean slate is kind of like a double whammy there. Um, but fasting helps with hormonal balance. So it's great for like if you're getting hot flashes. Um, you know, that that was like the one of the main things, because I just so happened to be close to a woman that was going through menopause when I when I was teaching fasting it was like midway through and hot flashes were just really a big thing for her. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't know. I've never experienced them. I don't know. If, I mean, I don't know if men get hot flashes. I've never really heard a man talk about that. But I know it's a common thing with with uh, women and going through menopause. And that was a huge thing. And she just loved. She doesn't get them anymore. She yeah. doesn't get them anymore. She was able to use uh, peppermint essential oil and uh, fasting. She was doing a lot of juice fasting and water fasting and was able to eliminate that. Yeah. But we have a friend of the channel. Her name is Reggie, Reg Edited on YouTube, Reg Edited on YouTube. And uh, she talks a lot about fasting with menopause because she was going through it at the time. So she'd be a great resource. I've interviewed her a few times as well. So cool. uh, that's the best, but I like to let the women really handle that. that yeah. 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 We'll stay in our lane. I become a menopausal expert. Nobody will ever <laughs> take me seriously because I've never done it myself. Yeah. Um, okay. Joel is exercise more beneficial at the end of a fast. Um, yes and no. It depends on the type of exercise. And again, what are your goals? Um, I personally, when I do longer fasts, I like to do um, higher intensity cardio in the beginning of my fast to kind of drive out all of the glycogen stores first, if that makes sense. So it'll get me into ketosis quicker. Um, if I'm doing like high intensity interval training, I also do cardio. I tend to do more cardio during a fast and then I'll do the strength training towards the end of a longer fast. Um, it, it depends on how long the fast is. And it depends on what your um, actual like physical goals are. Chris, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you. When it comes to those topics, I think you're really gonna outshine me. So, okay, I'll let you handle those. <laughs> this one speaks straight to 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 my heart right here. Can fasting help with addiction? It seems like around day three, my nicotine cravings almost disappear, but then I falter out of sheer habit. Is this just in my mind or is it real? Okay. This is like why one of the, like the main reason I fell in love with fasting was because when I came out of drug addiction and I was listen, I was addicted to everything, right? Like I went into this last treatment program, smoking cigarettes, chewing tobacco, shooting heroin, shooting cocaine, like doing everything, right? Um, fasting absolutely for me 
helped with addiction in two different ways. The mental, because it taught me that I do have self-discipline and I do have the power to control way more than I ever thought that I could, right? And the physical as well. I've heard this a lot with the nicotine cravings is that once you start fasting, the cravings for nicotine, the cravings for caffeine, they dissipate. And so if you're going back to it out of sheer habit, and this is this actually, maybe you'll get a kick out of this because I actually did this once. I was addicted to chewing tobacco at the time and I had to take a blood test in order to get life insurance, right? And they won't give you life insurance or it'll be really jacked up in price if you test positive for nicotine. So I stopped chewing for a week leading up to this blood test because they they sent a nurse to my home to do it. And the day she got there and took my blood and she left, I went to the gas station. I bought another 10 of chewing tobacco, even though I had just proven for seven days I didn't need it, right? But I went back and did it. So yeah, I mean, in my opinion and in my experience, it is out of sheer habit. You do it because well, for me, it was always, it's just like with my food addiction that I had in the past, I was doing it to have something to look forward to, to escape from some emotion. And so if you can find a way to push beyond that and find some other healthy substitute, um, yeah, you'll be able to kick the the nicotine in, in a week. There's a really good book too. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. But uh, I'll look it up after this this live stream, and I'll and I'll drop it in the in the chat, um, in the comment section, because there was a really good book that I read. It was written a long, long time ago, like maybe like forty or fifty years ago, about quitting smoking, and it's just like this like straightforward is like, this is not actually helping you. It's not actually making you feel better. You've just convinced yourself that it is. And, and, and I understand the struggle too, because out of all the things that I like, out of all of the substances that I ever did, nicotine was the hardest, like by mm. far, by far, because it's the most available too, you know? Men all pause. <laughs> That's good. Oh, here's one for you, Chris. To the point about heavy metals retained in the body, could that account for premature grain? Could clean slate help with that as well? Yes. Is it going to fix this here? Look at this. <laughs> um, yeah, premature grain, you know, that there's a lot of factors that play into that. Um, People, the most popular belief is that it's it's a mineral deficiency. So it's a deficiency more than um, necessarily heavy metals. But that's not to say that heavy metals can't have an impact. What I, okay, I'll just speak about personal experience. So I don't have any gray hairs. I'm 39, apparently. I was born in 84. I don't really like talking about my age because I just I don't the whole age thing is just not my thing. Like age is not a thing to me. But right. I was born in 84. So if you look at my contemporaries, you pro I probably should have gray hairs. But I what I have seen is hairs, discolored hairs, hairs that were trying to gray. I noticed them um, start to develop years ago. Let's just say this is probably about seven, eight years ago. And what I noticed was as I altered my diet, especially as I was getting into fasting and whatever, those hairs would go back black. Mm. They would go back. So uh, what in my experience, it's been purely from health. This is not a genetic thing because I know a lot of people talk about genetics. I have, a, I have a friend, one of our coaches, she's had gray hairs since she was really young. But she also had severe constipation since she's been really young, Right. So it's easy to say, oh, it's a genetic thing because it happened when you're really young. But no, like it's really a it's from what I understand, it's always been a health thing. Mm. They say copper is a copper deficiency. So it's kind of the reverse because copper yeah. would be a, a metal. Yeah. Right. Um, so they say copper uh, deficiency is kind of where the gray hairs comes from. I can't really it, it's it's definitely a, a difficult to put to pinpoint. Yeah, you know, I've heard people speak about it and, and be very confident about it. It's like a deficiency and it's this, but I don't know. Like, I haven't seen that, but I have seen 
through cleaning up my diet. And even to this day, if I get too far off my path, right? Because I want people to understand, like, I don't, I am not perfect at all. Mm -hmm. I went heavy on fasting. I learned a lot. I improved my health and wellness. And as I went into my maintenance schedule, I will get in slumps because I'm working and I'm focused on this and I'm not concerned with my health. And during those times, those little hairs will start getting discolored again. Yeah. And I know, okay, let me clean it up. Let me start cooking at home, eating from home again, eating more raw, things of that nature. I don't have a particular supplement I take except clean slate um, and like zero in. Those are the supplements that I take. And, I, and I'm always testing a product yeah. or a herb. So, yeah. Well, yeah, now you got me thinking because when I notice, so I'll get maybe like a total of eight gray hairs, but it's you, they usually only show up when I'm not sleeping great or I'm highly stressed. But you're talking about testing things out. Like if it's copper deficiency, I hadn't heard that. Maybe I should uh, like eat some pennies for the next three months and see if my beard, my beard doesn't go back to to the orangey brown that it usually is. Um, uh, maybe an easier experiment would just get a copper mug. And <laughs> yeah. Out of that. <laughs> yeah. Rather than eat dirty pennies. <laughs> yeah. Um, any recommendations on pure water for 50 days? This is your territory. Yeah. They're coming out the woodwork tonight. You're bringing yeah. it out of them, man. Uh, I love this though. Like you tell me when you're, when you're getting short on time, I'll go until there's no more questions. This is fun. It, the questions will never end. Trust me, I, I've done this before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so 50 days of fasting is no joke. And it, once again, it goes back to our earlier discussion. What type of fast do you want to do? Okay. So you're, you're saying pure water, Pure water is a different type of fast. So um, the, the best advice I can give you for doing a fast that long would actually be to build your fasting muscle. That would be the best option. So you're essentially going to create a regimen for yourself to get yourself acclimatized to fasting, get your body used to fasting, and then go into your fast like that. You can do preparation. Um, but, but for 50 days, I would say the preparation probably needs to be like two weeks. We usually do a one week preparation. I would prep for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And during that preparation, I'm going to be using supplements. I'm going to use a detox tea. I'm going to do a liver cl cleanse or flush of some sort. Um, like I said, me personally, I'm going to recommend clean slate. Definitely be taking that. Also, Clean slate is kind of a cheat because you could take it while you're fasting because it is ju it's just water. Um, they do they they use water they use seawater, okay. So there is a little bit of uh, salt and stuff and minerals in it, but when it comes to a pure water fast, it's not going to have any impact on your water fast, right? So you could cheat and use clean slate throughout the entire process, which I would recommend, and um, I would probably do like, I would probably do at least three, five day fasts, just kind of prep myself. You know, you could do pure water, you could do juice. I would, I would, I would actually recommend at least one of those fasts being juice. I would probably do the juice for at least seven days. Yeah. So you could like start, do your prep two weeks, do the cleanse, liver, boom, boom, boom. Then do a week of juice. I would do heavy juice. So that's half a gallon of juice or more per day. Ooh. And it's not, that's not just because what you want to do, what you're trying, what the goal is, clean your system out as much as possible. Because what's going to make your 50 day fast difficult is the detox symptoms, your elimination pathways not being open, things of that nature. So the juice is going to help to flush your system really well. And then I do two more five day fasts in preparation to start for the 50 after all of that. So that's probably what two weeks a week. Let's just call it, let's just call it a, a month of prep. And then after that, I do the prep. I do the 50 days. Yeah. There you go. I hope you were taking notes. I'm going to have to go back and watch that replay will be available. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go back and watch that one. <laughs> that's, that's off the top. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. That's not a, you know, a pre-made that's, you know, off the top of the head. Yeah. 
Tanny Tan Tan, thank you. And yes, on being transparent, if you ever want to talk further about breaking addictions and anything in that realm, feel free to shoot me a message. I'm an open book when it comes to that. I feel like, you know, God allowed me to go through these things so I can help other people who have similar struggles. Like that's what we're all here for. And Eileen, I appreciate this. So um, that book that I was referring to, that is the author, Alan Carr. Um was the book like i said it's an older book and it's very like straight and to the point it's an easy read and you just read it and you're like it just kind of just wakes you up you're like you're right like i don't actually need this thing i've just convinced myself that i do mm -hmm. well this is the, the benefit of fasting it really does wake you up a little bit like you mentioned earlier you do a fast for x amount of days and it's like oh wait i really did that yeah like it's empowering yeah so yeah. When it also, I mean, the thing with addictions too, like with, with breaking the food addiction, why fasting was so important for me is when you remove the, the crutches that you typically go to, like for me, if I had a bad day or my wife was mad at me or like something didn't go the way I wanted to, like, it's easy for me to turn to food as that emotional escape. But when you remove that as an option, it forces you to find another solution or deal with the actual underlying issue. And that's why, uh, like, that's why I'm such a huge proponent of like, do this stuff, try it out for yourself because more than just the weight loss, like the weight loss is a, and the improved health is like just a natural repercussion of it. What you're going to learn about do about yourself by doing it is so much greater than you could even imagine. Mm -hmm. Chris, where do you stand on chia seeds as a regular part of the daily diet? Go for it. They yeah. they have no negative benefit. Like yeah. or there's no negative side effect. Go for it. I've uh, I've used chia seeds to break longer fasts too. Like put a tablespoon of chia seeds in a glass of water and wait for them to gel up. You know they look like fish eggs or frog eggs, and then uh, and then I'll use that to break a fast. It's real easy on my digestive system. Oh yeah, very easy. You can also see because the seeds come out in your movements. You can see you can time your digestive system. Ooh, you know, yeah. You don't have to use food coloring or Lucky Charms to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you could also use a penny if you want. Yeah, Not right. That's my that's my next test, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, what are your thoughts on spirulina <laughs> and chlorella? Uh, I've I've taken spirulina in the past, um, just because when I was shopping, I saw it and I was like, oh, this is this is probably good for me. Um, but beyond that, I don't have any great recommendations, but I'm sure Chris <laughs> does. <laughs> I'm, you know, guys, when it comes to like sweeteners and stuff like that, uh, or I'm sorry, um, different supplements, I, um, I, I don't really do a lot of supplementation. So, I mean, yeah, it's fine. I've heard yeah. good things about it. I've never really used it, but I'm sure it's good. I don't, I don't have not too much to say about it. Yeah. They're asking for detox. I've yeah. never used it for detox. Yeah, so. me neither. Um, I've literally just used it. To, like I've thrown it in um, water in my blender bottle and drank it uh, when I was working out. And again, like there was, there was no reason for it other than I passed it in the store and I was like, Oh, I've never tried this before. Um, and all I noticed, and this is, yeah, what we were talking about, you know, watching your digestive system. All I noticed is that the, the really dark blue color of it changed the color of my mouth and my poop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, back to that 50 day fast, any recommendations during it? Yeah, I would say that you want to, you want to pick up some, um, uh, meditation practices, breath, breath work. We mentioned breath work earlier. Grounding can be a, an amazing tool for you. Once again, going back to the essential oils, these are all things you could use that you don't have to necessarily ingest or, you know, you want to do a pure fast. I respect that. Um, I would also recommend uh, if you can put yourself in, in, in an environment, look like inside your house is nine times more toxic than outside the air quality. Air quality plays a huge impact on like how you experience it fast, your detox symptoms, things of that nature. So increased air quality, whether it's getting outside more, cracking the window, just be cognizant of that. You know, um, 
And then your your overall environment. Who are you going to be around during this time? You know, it's not just what we ingest all the time. It's sometimes who we ingest. And it's not just the people. It could be music. It could be TV shows. Mm-hmm. I, I need you to understand, especially if you've never done like a long-term fast, you become hypersensitive to consumption holistically. Yeah. So you might think, oh, I'm going to do like a Star Wars marathon or I'm going to do this or I'm going to listen to this music. You may want to think about being intentional about what you consume holistically during this time because yeah. it is a spiritual process, whether you're doing it for spiritual reasons or not, like the body doesn't care. It's going to have ramifications. Yeah. So, you know, I I take that time when I do my long fast, I plan, OK, I'm going to read these books. I'm going to work on these projects. I'm going to be around these people. I'm going to stay away from these people. Like all of those things, like it sounds like a lot, but it is and it, it should be. Yeah. The 50 day fast is no joke. Yeah. So, yeah, I would be super intentional about that. Yeah, I think those are such good points, too, because like if you think back to what I was just saying, like when you remove the things that I typically go to to distract myself, right, like if it's food and now I'm going to use the next 50 days to do this really challenging thing, like I want to make the most out of it. So I don't want to replace the one thing that, you know, is an addiction if it is with another one, like doing a Star Wars marathon or whatever, like I want to replace it with good habits. Like I want to get my mind and my body in the practice of if I'm not feeling great, or I'm not feeling, you know, super happy, like this is the thing that I want to turn to, whether it's reading this book or going like, I swear, like going for walks is what I do the most when I'm doing longer fasts, because it's for me, it's multitasking. Like I use the time to pray and, and think, and it's also exercise, you know, and it gets my mind off of thinking about eating. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Real quick. How important is protein intake in between fasts again? So Joel, um, shoot me a message if I'm wrong here, but I think like if you're watching, um, Delauer and, um, all these questions seem to be in line, like you, you're, you're, you want to lose, body fat, you probably also want to build muscle. Um, Protein intake is going to be very important for building muscle. And if you're doing longer fast than protein intake in between those longer fasts is going to be very important. I personally like this is like the season that I'm in right now, like I'm lifting weights, but I'm also doing intermittent fasting. The number one thing that I prioritize is my protein intake. Um, I don't really track the other things I track the protein. And so um and, and it's tough, like if you're doing longer fasts and you've got restricted eating windows, so you're not eating a ton all throughout the day, like what you're going to want to do is focus on eating the protein first and foremost. And then after that, I focus on um, the the vegetables and the high quality fats, if that, if that makes sense. Weird question. I like weird questions. Does sunning sunning my water remove the plastic toxins that feminize men? I just learned about this information. I think it's an acronym that starts with B that is toxic to health. I don't I haven't even heard of that one. Okay. I know you have. <laughs> I know my man Chris has. <laughs> you you know it's well, you know it's funny. Um I didn't learn about sun water. I it was intuitive, right? So the fasting process taught me, like it was just part of it, taught me about the sun water. Um, But yeah, what the sun does is it actually breaks down inorganic compounds in the water and neutralizes them. So uh, it's it's a very powerful thing. I mean, the sun breaks down everything. Yeah. Um, So yes, you can you can sun charge it. Look, I'm going to recommend that you distill your water first, then sun charge it. It's twofold. Distilling your water removes the physical material out of it, right? So if we're talking about a chemical, it's going to remove the chemical. And some, you know, and then you get the charcoal filter and some people might think that's good enough. No, you got to understand water. Water has a crystalline structure. It can be imprinted on, meaning frequency can be imprinted on it. You can store data on water. The chemical constituents that make up that that chemical that um, is, you know, uh, might be artificial estrogen or something like that that's feminizing men. Oh, no. Um, I think I know which one she's talking about. Anyway, the frogs, they gave it to the frogs. Right. And then mm-hmm. turn them into girls. The chemical constituents that make up that that uh, product 
are still the frequency still embedded in the water. So this is why you have to sun charge it because mm -hmm. the sun charging will uh, break down the chemical compounds. Yes, but it also reformats the water so that it no longer retains the memory of the chemicals in the water. And this is how they get us with the filters and stuff. Because yeah. they'll tell you, yeah, we got this Berka filter or whatever. The filter is zero water filter. And it takes out 99.9% .9 of whatever. And it doesn't even mention um, the the frequent the, the 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 memory of the water the frequency that's imprinted on the water and like no one talks about that people don't know that's a thing like like they don't even know that water can do that so um you have to do that as well so sun charging if you had to do one that'd be the better to do but i would say do both to okay. get kind of the best result so distill first then sun yeah yeah hey lonnie thank you does only raw or juice fast have a shrinking period? Uh, it, it, I guess like are you is they referring to the shrinking as in like the skin shrinking period? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's your experience on this? My my I only can just kind of give like a common sense reasoning to it. I would say the fasting is going to be better. So just go with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, good, good, uh, good intuition. Um, there is a weird thing happening in the juice community. I think it's the juice community or the raw fruit community where sometimes I see people lose large amounts of weight and they still do have loose skin. Mm. Now, is it similar to the fitness community as far as like their loose skin? No, not at all. Yeah. But I, I have seen that from time to time. And the unfortunate thing about it is, like, I know you guys, someone mentioned, um, have uh, Mindy Perret Pels come on mm -hmm. and, and interview her and stuff like that. And I reach out to people, not her specifically, but I reach out to people. I try to get these interviews done. And you'd be surprised that, you know, like people, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I don't know. They don't want to, you know, they either don't want to do it. They don't respond. I don't know what's going on. So I haven't got an opportunity to really nail this down because I'm not a big juice fasting. Infl I don't teach juice fasting that heavy. Yeah. So what I can say is for the most part, you're going to get similar results. But as Justin mentioned, water fasting will be better. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be substantially better. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would say like test it out. Like if you test it out and experience good results, like let us know. We'd be super interested in hearing about that. But uh, if you want to you know, make sure that you're going to get the shrinking period. Just do the the water fasting. And yeah, this is very similar. Um, do we get autophagy from juice fast or feast? From juice fast or feast? Um, feast, uh, juice feasting. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You're, you're still going to get the benefits of autophagy. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, there's even research. That, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, there's even research you can get some um, benefits of autophagy just from basic uh, caloric restriction. Right. But I would say that it's not going to be the same or as as great as as just straight water fasting. Right. I mean, that's essentially what fasting mimicking is. Is you know, you're getting the benefit of fasting without fasting, so you're going to get some benefit of autophagy. But like we talk about the fasting shrink week. Once again, I, I've never really heard anyone else talk about it. I think it's because once again we're in the trenches, so we're we're experiencing, we're learning, and I'm I'm looking at data, I'm collecting data on purpose, so we're learning different than other people. But you're not going to see the fasting shrink week with a 90 day juice fast. Yeah. But but you are going to get autophagy, and you're going to get amazing results. You know. Yeah. And Lonnie has one more question. Can I juice ginger, parsley, or dandelion if I want to avoid loose skin? Because I read they are listed as diuretics. Uh, again, I, I, I personally, I'm again, I, I'm not an expert, right? I just know that I, I don't have any loose skin, and I was drinking a ton of water while I was water fasting. I personally wouldn't. Um, recommend anyone to use diuretics while they're fasting. Um, I think you're just going to make it harder on yourself. And I don't think that it's going to 
affect the elasticity of your skin. I think the fasting itself and the autophagy, breaking down those old tissues that aren't needed anymore, um, is what's going to get rid of the loose skin versus, you know, dehydrating yourself with diuretics. That is the traditional route people take to lose weight. This is why when we very first started teaching water fasting, people were always in the comments talking about, you're just losing water weight. Because yeah. that's what people are used to seeing. If you're wearing a sauna suit, it's just water weight. Like that's when you can say it's just water weight. Like a sauna suit is not just water weight, but 99% of it is water weight. You're going to get some toxins in the water, right? Because like, that's what sweat does. But to the point where it's going to be beneficial to like your weight loss, like your actual fat loss. No, not really. You're just dehydrating yourself. And then you don't you don't go and rehydrate yourself, right? Because like people who are wearing sauna suits or taking diuretics and doing things to help to dry themselves out, lose more weight, they're not then going to go and rehydrate. That defeats the logic. So um, I would recommend staying away from diuretics. Now, dandelion is incredible. Ginger is incredible. Parsley can be incredible. Depending on how you use it, these things can be incredible. But remember, when it comes to like plants, herbs, herbs are for healing. OK, they're not supposed to be daily supplements. Yeah. They're not. It's for healing. So um, are they beneficial? Yes. Would I recommend it as a daily supplement, like just throughout your process? No, not necessarily. You know, you, you got to take breaks from taking certain things and you got to be intentional. But. It's better than any other type of supplement. I mean, especially if you go pick the dandelion out the grass. <laughs> yeah, it was actually something I learned when I was in high school. We did like a, a field trip and I think it's like the, the Amish, like once per year do a dandelion tea or dandelion soup fast for like five, or it's a cleanse. It's a dandelion salad cleanse is what it is okay. um, because it's really, really good for detoxification. Incredible. But I'm sure they drink tons of water while they're doing that as well. D Dandelion is incredible. Like, first of all, let's talk about how they, the like the propaganda, the government wants us to believe that dandelions are weeds. Like, when did that term actually come into existence? And for what purpose? I can almost guarantee it was propaganda. Yeah. So understand that our ancestors would have known the benefits of dandelion and they would have probably passed that information down to a certain point until the children started getting formally formally educated in school and the teachers in the school are telling them your grandma she's a cuckoo okay you can't <laughs> pull a plant out the grass boil it and get any health benefit from it right so they started to manipulate our minds and this is we, we started to disassociate ourselves with the ancestors that would do that and teach that so you're, you're, when, it, when it comes to weeds, weeds are herbs. And if you've noticed, you can't get rid of them. Like it is, it is a necessary part of this planet, this earth, because it's a necessary part of our healing. And it's not just for humans. Animals use it as well. So dandelions are incredible. I just want people to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And for the record, grass is actually a weed. <laughs> it's just a controlled weed. Yeah. Grass would definitely be <clears throat> Is it okay to take activated charcoal while water fasting? This is similar to, to a question that um, came up on your interview. Somebody was dealing with gout, I believe, and they were taking chart cherry. Tart cherry. I was like, I said that, and I was like, that doesn't even make sense. What is that? What did I just say? Tart it's cherry. getting late, man. It's getting <laughs> late here. <laughs> um, but so tart cherry, activated charcoal while you're water fasting. Um I would assume that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have no, I have no problems with that. Once again, this goes back to like what type of fast are you doing? What are the you know, results you're looking to get? Um, if you want to add that to your fast, I see no, no issues with that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Back to the water. How do you use still water? Just boil it or should I just buy distilled water before sun charging it? Thanks for all of these awesome answers. One of the tricky things I've wondered this too. So you're going to answer one of my questions now too, Chris is buying distilled water typically comes in plastic containers. It does. Yeah. So it's like, how do you get around that? Well, I sun charge my water. Okay. Um, you can also, you can also, there are these uh, crystal jars. I don't really have one right here, but there's these crystal uh, bottles. 
you the well it's a glass bottle but you have crystals at the bottom um frequency is important when it comes to water but um you can also water delivery services will deliver distilled water in the five gallon jugs nice or two and a half like if you want that you know what i mean if you want to go that if you want to go that route um, that'll give you a better, better pure water. But you know, buying a b- buying a countertop distiller is the simple solution. It'll cost you two hundred dollars for a decent one. I don't recommend buying the really cheap ones. They 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 typically the the more you spend on it, you're gonna get a better quality product. Let's yeah. just say that if you got five hundred dollars to spend, you know, look f- look for the best one in that price range. It makes a difference. Yeah. But yeah, you know, you could you can um. This is a common uh, mistake, I guess, or misconception. You can't boil water to distill. Like, boiling it is not distilling it. Now, if you boil it and you capture the steam and, you, and you're and you able to collect that and move it to a different container, that would be distillation. Ooh. So, yeah, you're, you're capturing the steam. But once again, even if you do that, you still need to run it through charcoal. So the the way that dis, the way that st- distilled water works, the contaminants in the water have a higher boil point than the water itself. So you're boiling it, and the water evaporates before the contaminants do. Yeah. But then there are some contaminants that will evaporate with the water, and that's what the charcoal filter is for. Wow. Bo- boiling it. Um. I, I'm sorry. I'll just say this. Boiling it is is for like microorganisms. It kills microorganisms in yeah. the water. No, I was just gonna say we just, we just got a master class on water. I love it. Oh man, water! <laughs> I studied water. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> How important is salt during a water fast? Um, personal experience: most of the time, I don't take in any salt during fasts. Uh, every once in a while, if I get a like a killer headache uh i'll put like a pinch of like himalayan salt or sea salt in a glass of water and chug it down and it typically removes the headache um but that's only a recent thing for me uh all the fast that i did to lose the 43 pounds that i lost like i didn't i didn't take in any salts so inconsequential I mean, I don't, I don't think. Okay. That was, I wonder if it's been my signal the whole time dropping. Yeah. Sorry. You like cut out there for a second, but I could hear you go in and out. Okay. This is the <laughs> sign. We're about to wrap up. My internet's yeah. getting tired. Yep. Um, but yeah, so, so salt, you don't, you don't need to put salt in your water. You don't have to take salt with your fast. I've literally, I've only ever done it maybe like once or twice just because so many people ask. So I just tested it. But outside of that, I've never done it outside of those one or two times fasting. Yeah. So no, it's not a necessary thing. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And so um, with the remaining questions here, what I'll try and do is over the, the weekend here, maybe not tomorrow, but on Sunday, I'll try and come in and uh, drop answers to the questions that we didn't get to. But Chris, I think you and I are planning on doing this again in the future as well. So we'll keep you all posted on on that. Did I lose you again, Chris? Are you still there? Is it just me? I'm all alone. All right, y'all. Well, thanks for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Um, Sorry for the questions that I didn't get to, but like I said, I will jump on here in the next couple of days and try and respond to those in the comments. I'll tag Chris where I don't know the answers to some of these, um, and we'll see you on the next live stream. Take care, everyone.